once again, our thanks to the folks at LTV for bringing us all together and to, to the planning department and the planning board staff. They're hard work in keeping us in front of the public. We have um, a number of matters on for site plan review, three matters on, and we also have two issues involving uh, rezoning, which we have to give comments um, and recommendations to the town board. Uh, I would uh, remind people who are watching and who uh, may recall before the days of COVID that we, uh, during work session, were accepting public comment um, in, in very limited form, but we would, we, you know, two minutes or three minutes of comments. Um, but uh, we haven't been able to do that during, uh, uh, during these uh, Zoom meetings, and that's going to continue to be the policy as long as we're in Zoom, that there won't be public comment uh, spoken during the uh, work sessions. Um, but of course, anyone who has anything that they want to put in, in writing with respect to any application, certainly uh, welcome to do and encouraged to do. I will say that there are two matters on that are not applications that are in the um, tonight's agenda. Those are the uh, rezoning issues, um, which we'll get into later. Uh, and uh, because it's not an application, um, I, I think we may be able to uh, take very limited comments on that. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see when we get there. Uh, but um, for now, we have uh, the first application tonight is... Uh, Site plan review for Maidstone Acres. Uh, Marco uh, is the, uh, uh, the planning department uh, staff person on it. Is the applicant for uh, Maidstone Acres on the line? Chair, what is their name? Uh, Rich Tom. Girardi. I'm sorry? Say it again. Rich Girardi. One Do we have a Rich Girardi on the line? I don't see anyone on. I do have one caller, but the ID is not that name. I can open it and see if that's them. Let, let's see if it is. Okay, just a moment, please. Okay. I'm going to unmute the caller with the last four digits, 1510. Hi, um, my name is Nina Bataller, and I can only, con you know, we're going to talk about the zoning for Wayne Scott, and I okay, can't call you any other way. Than that's fine. Thank you. Um, that's later on in our agenda. Uh, so uh, we were looking to see if you were somebody else. So we'll, uh, if LTV can put uh, the caller back on to hold. Um, all right. Well, the applicant on the Maidstone Acres uh, uh, application, I, I guess they're, they're, they're appearing on their own behalf. So let's go forward with the next application, which will be Scoville Hall uh, Terrace and Generator Well. Um, and after we're done with that application, we'll see if Mr. Girardi has come back, uh, or not come back, but has joined us, and then we can take Maidstone Acres um, <clears throat> if he's here. Um, but for Scoville Hall, Will Highland is on for the Planning Department, Randy, I saw Randy pop up there. There is, there's Randy. Hi. And Mr. Whalen, I think you were here last time on Scoville Hall. So we have a full house on that. So, all right, let's go forward, Will, with Scoville Hall. Thanks. Okay. So, Scoville Hall is the parish house for the First Presbyterian Church located on Main Street. Uh, this is a uh, follow up from a last review day in February 2020. Uh, a site plan application was made in 2018. Uh, let me share my screen so everyone can see what I'm referring to. Okay, so uh, the original site plan proposed to construct a, uh, a, a an extension, a brick terrace on site, uh, a high fence with planting on both sides, as you can see here, um, uh, a concrete dump, a, a concrete dumpster pad, a, uh, and 
a well pit to house a generator as displayed here. Um, and additionally, uh, the original plan was to uh, also uh, move an existing shed that's already on the site, but now the plan has been modified to simply remove the existing shed. Uh, as proposed, the project will require a variance for, from total lot coverage to be granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the applicant has, as I said before, has revised the survey to remove the existing shed. Uh, with this change, the proposed lot coverage is not, the total lot coverage variance needed for the outdoor terrace dumpster pad and generator well is 991 square feet. And the planning board to form a consensus on whether or not to send comments to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, additionally, uh, Previously, the applicant had submitted an acoustic report uh, to deal with potential uh, noise generated uh, from the uh, proposed generator and generator pit. Uh, the noise standards of the town code state that the noise level in any real property line in a residential district shall not exceed uh, 65 decibels from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and 50 decibels from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, with the acoustic treatment proposed, uh, the noise level of the generator at the property lines is still projected to satisfy only the daytime requirements, 65. Uh, and it, it was previously recommended by the planning board that uh, the maximum noise level by the generator be 50 decibels at property lines in the previous site plan review. Uh, the app in the enclosed letter regarding the changes in the pending site plan, the applicant acknowledged that they are aware of the planning board's concerns regarding generator noise and they are working to ameliorate the issue. However, they did not offer specific solutions as to how they would do so. And it will be up to the planning board whether those concerns, uh, what they mean for the future of project approval. Uh, additionally, uh, there were previously issues outlined on a lighting plan that was submitted that depicted seven 10 foot pole mounted lighting fixtures. Uh, the, the illumination level on these lighting fixtures as originally proposed uh, the lumen levels were too high and, uh, and the board's lighting policy calls for lumen levels of a fixture mounted at a height of 10 feet to not exceed 2,500. The proposed lighting is far brighter than the recommended illumination level and does not comply with the board's guidelines. At the time, it was recommended that the applicant reduce the lighting on the parking lot and submit manufacturer's cut sheets for proposed new fixtures, which would meet the planning board's guidelines as well as all application applicable reg uh, regulations of the town code. Uh, as of now, these previous lighting concerns still stand and uh, would still have to be addressed in the future. Uh, and in addition, uh, the title of the project, uh, Scoville Hall Terrace and General Well Site Plan is still missing on the revised site plan. And the uh, proposed six foot high privet head should also be noted on the plan. So in conclusion, the previous project concerns regarding generator noise and lighting will still need to be addressed. And the planning board should consider sending comments to the Zoning Board of Appeals regarding the required variance from total lot coverage. Thank you very much. Very thorough report, Will. Appreciate it. Mr. Whalen. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. R Richard Whalen for uh, Landmarks, representing uh, the Amagas Presbyterian Church, which owns Scoville Hall. Uh, so I'll deal with the, uh, the uh, generator first. So <clears throat> around 2016, uh, Ben Krupinski Builders had a a generator that was, I don't know where it came from, maybe a former uh, client that owned it or something, but it was a Detroit diesel generator. Um, I presume it still exists somewhere. It's been in storage now for, what, at least five years. Uh, it was an older generator, even back in 2018, when I tried to do some research into its, um, you know, possible noise levels or uh, decibel levels, I could not find any information on it. And in fact, the generator was no longer being manufactured by uh, the company that makes it. So uh, we hired SoundSense to do a, uh, a basically a sound study, a sound analysis, and they had to make some assumptions about the generator, basically that it was a noisy old generator. Um, where the, what the church is thinking today is it's been years, this generator has been in storage, it's an old probably inefficient as well as noisy machine, even if it can be, uh, even if it were work today. So what we would probably do, mean the church, uh, and I am a member, uh, what we would probably do is uh, at some point uh, do fundraising and try to buy a new generator, buy or somehow acquire a new 
a more energy and noise efficient generator. So um, that would be a fundraising effort. It's not something the church is in a position to go ahead and just buy a generator. We would do fundraising. We might look for grants. Um, but the objective would be to try to find something. Also, more modern generators tend to be smaller in size. The idea would be to get something that um, hopefully would meet the decibel limitations imposed by the town without even a, uh, with, you know, pro hopefully without even the need for baffling because the Detroit diesel generator, just to be the, uh, the, the noise ratings that Will was referring to, required a fairly complicated above ground uh, baffle system, which in itself was kind of expensive for us to do. So the, uh, we don't have the generator in mind right now. Um, what I would propose with regard to the generator and the generator well, uh, when we hopefully come back to you after going to the zoning board. Did you uh, get the link from Thomas? You're, you're hearing me, right? Yeah. Excuse me, everybody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, let me see. Jody, I I just Jody muted. pardon me, everybody. Okay. This is Mike at the station. Yeah, Jody, I just muted you. I believe you spoke accidentally. Go ahead, Richard. All right, sorry. So uh, what we would like to do is get approval for the generator well uh, as part of the project. Um, if at such time as we have an actual generator that we're either looking to buy or looking to acquire or actually possess, then we would come back to the planning board for site plan approval uh, before that generator is installed and to get your approval to do it at that time. So that's where things stand with the generator. Uh, what what is that? Go, 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 finish your thought. All right. Um, lighting, uh, I agree with the planning department. We did try to get assistance a couple of years ago from uh, a lighting contractor. They weren't really very helpful, but we under, you know, we know what you're looking for in terms of lighting levels and so forth. And, you know, we'll have to go back and, and work on that and, you know, bring it down to a level which is acceptable to the board. I don't, I don't see a problem with that. It's just some work on our part. Um, uh, obviously, we'll make sure the next time the title, this survey was actually generated back in October. So we'll make sure the next submission has the correct title. I did have one question at the end of the memo. I uh, will ask about showing the, the privet edge. I, 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 I'm guessing he means the proposed plantings that he wants that clarified that that is to be a six foot privet hedge. Um, I just seek clarification on that. Well, let me ask you, how, how does your um, uh, holding in abeyance, if you will, the issue of the generator impact uh, the rest of your application? Uh, it wouldn't. I mean, the only other two elements of the application are a concrete pad for a dumpster. I think right now the dumpster is either sitting on the I don't recall. It's either sitting on the grass. I think it's on the grass next to one of the mm -hmm. one of the uh, uh, parking spaces. But you know, obviously, it's preferable to put put it um, on its own pad at the end of the the central aisle to the parking lot. And the terrace is the key element to the application. Really, the terrace is the primary thing driving this. You mm -hmm. know, we, the uh, it adjoins the tea room, which is on the first floor of Scoville Hall, and we already use that outdoor area. Even though it's grass, we do use it for events and so forth. And, uh, you know, we'd like to have a hard surface there. So the, the, the terrace has always been the, the most important aspect of the application for the church. Okay. All right. Randy? You're muted, Randy. There you go. Okay. So Excuse me, everybody. I'm sorry to interrupt one more time. This is Mike at the TV station. Um, mm -hmm. Will, you're welcome to reshare again. I just accidentally stopped your screen sharing. Uh, I just saw that you had your email up. I didn't know if that yeah, was on sorry, purpose. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, no, no, I, I was trying to, I wasn't thinking. Sorry. Just tracking, making security, just making sure. Go right ahead. Sorry, everybody. Okay, no, thanks. Go ahead, Randy. <clears throat> um, so, uh, Let's just go in the order that um, uh, Rick did. Uh, so the the um, the generator, it's, it's uh, I would be more comfortable if if the church would would choose a generator uh, that is quiet and energy efficient, and then that would be the you know that would be what we would prove and then they could do their fundraising saying, you know, if they have the approval 
otherwise, we really don't know what the dimensions are going to be, or um, it's sort of um, a, uh, a bird in the bush, kind of. <clears throat> um, the other thing I thought is, uh, I don't know if Rick has come across this, but remember we had a, a generator application at the mobile station that had, I think, state funding for... Um, right, from NYSERDA. It was from NYSERDA. That's right. Or, yeah, to, to get to get prepared for an emergency better yep. than we were with uh, Sandy, I think. Yep, that's so right. There might be more funding, uh, especially since this is a center for people to gather in an emergency. Um, probably the mobile station would know, or maybe Kathy knows more than... Uh, the other, the lighting, uh, I, I think, you know, we hear you, uh, the lighting has to be done. So there's going to be perhaps a delay for the lighting anyway, because uh, you have to, you have to get that together. Um, the, the, the patio to me is, uh, I, I'm pretty neutral if the zoning board uh, I would leave that up to the zoning board, uh, but I, I do feel like the lighting and the and the noise level of the generator are important. Um, and then the planting, I guess we need something more uh, more specific. Uh, <clears throat> I don't I don't know. Uh, normally we have a you know a section drawing of a of a proposed hedge and a fence. We have a sketch of uh, it, you know, an elevation drawing showing us what, what's going in and how far apart and how high and that sort of thing. So that's pretty much it for me. How do you feel about sending the planning board comments regarding the variance? The, the zoning board? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> so, How do you feel about that? I, I guess I. So we've talked about this uh, obviously last time. You know, my feeling is a, a patio for the church probably means they want to have some sort of summer activities out there or gatherings. Um, and it is a residential area, uh, but it is a church and. Uh, so I, I guess I'm I'm neutral. I, I would I would defer to the ZBA's judgment. Yeah, I kind of uh, I, I, I'm wondering does anybody on the planning board feel strongly that we should make comments to the zoning board on this application? That's our first question, consensus question. Um, does anybody feel strongly that we should? Be commenting well, on this particular I, I think we yeah. I think we I think we should I mean I think that it and the zoning board always benefits from uh, comments from us unless the board doesn't have any comment and then we wouldn't send anything but I, I mean I think good. Randy raises an important point and I tend to lean in his direction that I'm sort of neutral about whether the church can have events or not but I think that it is in a residential area and that's not an insignificant impact on the residential area. And that I think the church is generally a good neighbor, you know, that they follow those general principles. Yeah, but in, um, terms, of plan in terms of planning though, I mean, I yeah. think the ZBA is capable of knowing that on their own. Uh, is, there right. any plan is there any planning issue well, the planning issue is the impact on the residential community. Yeah. That's our purview. You know, that's what yeah. we're supposed to be. That's our, you know, that's our, our uh, raison d'etre as to, you know, measure and evaluate the impacts on the residential community. But in this instance, because it's a church, I'm not, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, you know, there's going to be events and so on there, which I suspect they're going to do. I mean, churches always need to raise money. Uh, if they have weddings or, and I seem to remember that was kind of the uh, idea at the beginning. And that's, you know, people do that. That's part of life. But I uh, imagine that, that those events could be uh, governed by the special event permit, um, you know, which 
they would reasonably have to acquire in order to do that. So um, I don't, can, you know. Does anybody else probably, Well, they can probably have the event on the grass just as easily. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, just think, you know, yeah. I, that's that's the only thing is if they're if they want to do that they could probably do it anyway but the brick patio makes it a little more durable and foul weather and that kind of thing yeah sure i mean i i don't have any objection to it except for the impacts that it may have on the residential neighbors and i think if the zoning board is going to conduct a hearing on that they'll hear from people and they'll decide mm -hmm. you know on the merits on that but that would be my loan comment really to the zoning board of appeals i mean everything else rick has said they're going to take care of so i think that's yeah, that, that's it's really the only i mean the generator is the next question and that's held in abeyance for want of a better word yeah the uh, exterior lighting sounded like uh the applicant was going to address it so the only issue really is the plan is is the planning board comments if any to the zoning board does anybody else feel like we need to make comments any other board members yeah, Sam, Ian here. Uh, I, I I do. I I think you know. As I've said before, I think we always should make comments, even if the comments are that we're ambivalent or indifferent. And and that's where I fall on this. I think there's no planning issue that dictates they need a patio. If it uh, complied with the code, I would certainly support it. The applicant's looking to vary the code, and that's a zoning board thing. So I think it's up for them to decide. But I think it always behooves us and them for them to hear if we are indifferent, as opposed to not sending anything. And keeping them guessing so well i mean i'm indifferent so i say sam, sam what if we said um that we you know we basically def are, are are happy to defer to the zoning board but that we are concerned about the impacts on the adjacent residential properties well, again i mean i i don't know that it necessarily rises to the level of concerned which is pretty low on the bar <laughs> yeah but, but i'm not listen I, i'm not i'm not saying that's the way it's got to be if anybody i would love to hear from you know the rest of the board and you know I, I, i'm i'm in the camp of uh if we're going to make a comment the comment that i would make uh is that i'm indifferent that we are indifferent to it i think if we if we do it the way that randy just suggested where we have a concern uh i think that you know puts too much weight on on the negative aspect of uh what we think about this patio and that's not what we're saying what we're saying is that we're indifferent and it's really a zoning board decision so i don't think we should weigh in on it i i'm just i'm for the neutrality more than anything else and if we need to make a comment, that's the comment that I would make. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm agree. I agree with that. Ed and Sharon? Well, I, I agree with that because then, you know, zoning board has the opportunity for a public hearing. So the, you know, the noise in the neighborhood will come out in the public hearing if anybody in the residence is, is concerned. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Yeah. Ed? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I actually am at Ian's camp that I think we should comment to, uh, to the ZBA when we're, when we're asked to. I think it's a good thing. Uh, in this case, I would phrase it as we don't have an objection, right? I would simply phrase it like that. Um, and they'll, they'll apply their own standards to this, which include, you know, kind of concern about uh, noise as it impacts a residential neighborhood, if, if that's part of their consideration. Can I just uh, clarify one thing? Please, um, the, the relief that they're going to need from the Zoning Board of Appeals um, relates to um, total lot yes. coverage. It's not really direct, uh, directly related to, let's say, a setback from, from a property yard, which might raise concerns over noise or something of that sort. Um, so there, the ZBA's deliberation is going to be about uh, the issue of the excessive coverage, which is in, uh, I believe, about 900 square feet. However, um, this does not qualify as a minor site plan, so it will be required to have a public hearing in front of the planning board as well, at which time the public will also have an opportunity to speak, and that's probably the more appropriate time um, for the potential for um, impacts on the neighbor from noise and things of that sort to, to be discussed and to be heard. So, Good point, Sarah. Uh, well, well, can I just make the other comment that the noise, nobody can grant a, no, a variance from the noise ordinance. So unless they can demonstrate um, 
you know, th th that the generator or whatever they're going to use there is compliant, then, then it's a no-go, you know. I also just did want to thank the applicant for taking these steps to bury the, the uh, generator because that was, was something we had asked them to do. So I think that was a, that was a good move in the right direction. Yeah, that, but the, the, the whole generator issue sounds like it's going to be subject of another conversation for another day. Um, although I agree with you about that, Kathy, it's better to be underground. That came up, I think, the first time we had this application. Mm -hmm. Glad that the applicant is moving in that direction. All right, yeah, so uh, wrap, then wrapping this up, I guess, we, is there a general agreement that we can say that we have no objection? Uh, I think Ed, that was your language, um, that we have no objection to the uh, application to the, uh, for the various zoning board. Is that, are we in agreement on that, folks? Yeah, that works. Yes. Okay, very good. How, right. does it, how does it work, Sam, in that the the uh, application as far as lighting and the the generator are not are not complete so will they file they'll file an application of the zoning board with those items not clear i think that uh, mr whalen can respond to that but i think the answer is they're going to be coming back to us with that somewhere down the road correct Yes, Richard Whalen again. So first of all, we have an application pending with the zoning board, and the next step there would be, <clears throat> you know, for them to schedule a public hearing on uh, the lot total lot coverage variance. Um, that's going to take, you know, it'll take a little while. I'm sure it'll be a few months before we are through the zoning board. Uh, in that period of time, I hope to address the lighting issue. So when we come back to you, hopefully with a zoning board variance in hand, we would come back also with a uh, a plan for the lighting. In other words, I want to be able to deal with that uh, during this interaction. Mm -hmm. um, on the, I just want to, I do want to clarify on the, uh, with regard to the plantings, all we're proposing is privet edge six feet high. So we show that where that would be planted. I don't know that we need an elevation drawing. It's going to be six foot tall privet edge. That's really the one, uh, you know, vegetative barrier that we're proposing to do. And hopefully, you know, what we're showing on the site plan, uh, along with something sane, six foot tall privet edge is sufficient. Just so. speaking um, on behalf of the planning department, um, I think we feel that would be sufficient, just if the notation was changed to be specific to the height, the, the species, uh, the type of plant, um, you know, on the site plan, um, because it's not a complicated thing. It's not like a full comprehensive site landscaping plan. It's just one notation, one type of plant. So. We feel that's sufficient. All right, so we'll do that because right now it just says vegetation or something. That's some very, uh, it's not specific. Um, lastly, you know, with the regard to the uh, the generator, um, we're not going to propose a generator unless it complies with the town's noise standards. That's really where we are. Whether that involves getting, the, you know, it will involve a new generator, presumably, If we, again, if we go forward with it. Um, and I, by the way, I appreciate the, uh, the comments about checking with NYSERDA and so forth. But if we can get the funding on um, the will look to buy a generator that with or without noise baffling will meet the uh, the town's decibel reading limitations in a residential area. So uh, maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. So yeah. anyway, I appreciate your time on this tonight. Thank you. Okay. Very good. All right, uh, we're gonna move on to the next item, which is actually we're gonna move back. I understand that uh, Mr. Girardi is uh, in the waiting room right now. I see yes. his name up on the screen. Yes, Chair, I'm going to allow them in now. There's just a moment. Comments about checking with NYSER and so forth. Um, we'll look to buy a generator. Mr. Wayne, you're, you're, you can be heard. We'll meet the, uh, the town's decibel reading limitations in a residential area. Excuse me, everybody. Someone has several, to keep their yep, television on. Um, anyway, I appreciate your time. Excuse me, Mr. So, um, he's, Richard. He's right, uh, we're going to move on yes. to the next item, which is actually... That's a replay. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. Uh, if I could ask everyone to just uh, wait one second. This is Mike, the director at LTV. I'm going to be muting Mr. Girardi for a moment. Um, excuse me, Mr. Girardi, there's an echo due to the fact that you have the broadcast in your room. If you could mute that, please so that you're only is that me you're talking to correct now that you've muted it it sounds better okay okay we can, we can continue 
Everyone's welcome to unmute and come back in. Mr. Chairman, do you want to unmute yourself? Sam, you're muted. There we go. Okay, we're all on the same page, and we're all on the same uh, at the same point on the uh, broadcast. Correct? Yes, Chair. We're ready I to am. go. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Girardi, thank you for being here. Um, the way this will work is that first we'll hear from Marco Wu from the Planning Department to give his report, then you'll have an opportunity to speak. I understand you don't have an attorney or other plan professional planner representing you. Uh, but you'll have an opportunity to speak after Mr. Wu gives his report. And then um, Mr. Krug, Ed Krug from the uh, planning board will uh, speak on the application. Then we'll have a discussion. There are a few items uh, that the planning sure. department right. helps. Hello? Right. There are a few items and you being here. Um, excuse me, everybody. This is Mike again from the again? TV. Yes. We're uh, excuse me. Richard Girardi Jr., I see you. Um, you're in, you can you please turn down the audio in your room, which is displaying the audio of the meeting? You can't have the broadcast in the same space while you're using Zoom at the same time. That's creating a feedback loop. Simply only communicate through Zoom. Through Zoom. How's that now? Perfect. That, that, okay, sorry, that was... Okay, oh, all right. There. Thank you. All right, so anyway, uh, I don't know if you heard, but first Mr. Wu will give the report from the planning department. Then you'll have an opportunity to speak. As I uh, was saying, I, I understand you don't have an attorney or a professional planner on your behalf, so you'll be allowed to speak directly. Right. And then after that, uh, Ms. Krug, at Krug from the planning board, will give a report. Planning board will have a discussion. There are a number of questions that the planning department has prepared uh, for us uh, to address uh, in the course of uh, Mr. Krug's report, and uh, then we'll wrap up this application for now. This is an ongoing process, the planning process, um, and uh, you know, so the the likelihood is that there'll be further meetings down the road. All right, uh, Marco, you're muted right now. Go on, mute yourself. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna put on. Um, a bigger, oops, a bigger overview of the area first. So you can see that this is in Springs around Three Mile Harbor. Um, this is, so the, what I have highlighted in teal is uh, NB. These are the lots in question. Uh, the subject lots, uh, it's surrounded by mostly residential uses, um, as you can see, uh, A5 over here, B zoning, uh, A zoning. Uh, a residence, B residence, uh, and Three Mile Harbors to the to the west. Can you so, tighten up on that? Sorry. Can yeah, yeah, I will. I will. I'm just. I, this was just a brief yeah, okay. uh, overlook. And then this is the 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 aerial that's zoomed in a bit further. Um, I do have additional pictures, but before we will get there, um, everyone sees where the aerial is, and I'm going to go to the site plan right now. And uh, I'll zoom in. Uh, when necessary. Um, so this is an application to construct a parking area with associated fencing and drainage for cargo trailers, an area for outdoor storage, a concrete pad for an eight foot by 14 foot walking cooler, uh, and a proposed smoker on a 6,899 square foot parcel zoned NB neighborhood business uh, near Three Mile Harbor in Springs. Uh, the parcel is cleared of natural vegetation. It contains three attached pre-existing non-conforming buildings. Uh, containing a restaurant use and a single family residence. The residence is considered to be a pre existing non conforming use in an NB zoning, while a restaurant use is considered to be a permitted use. So these are the three um, structures, well, three attached structures. And so we have the residence here, which is two story frame building, uh, a little one story, is a second story deck um, here. I believe this is part of the residence as well. Uh, and then the restaurant portion is in this square here. Uh, the cargo trailers are located here. Uh, just so some history for the parcel. Um, although there are two Suffolk uh, County tax map numbers, uh, the lots are considered uh, by the town as merged properties. 
the parcel was originally a two-story frame residence with an attached one-car garage, an attached one-story frame commercial structure with a basement, uh, and a two-story, uh, sorry, a two-car garage all erected prior to the adoption of zoning. Um, so around, and that, that, that garage, that one uh, car garage is what used to be this, uh, and it was converted into living space um, in a ZBA application that was done in the 70s. Um, so in around 1979, there, it appears that the one-story commercial structure, uh, which was this structure here, uh, was converted into a restaurant, uh, and converted into a restaurant according to uh, previous building permits. Uh, the most recent CO that was issued in 2005 and aerials indicate the building footprints have remained the same. Um, it appears that the existing parking for the residents and restaurant are located in the right of way, which is Maystone Park Road and uh, Richard, Richardson Avenue. So the applicant is proposing to delegate the western yard portion of the property for outdoor storage, a proposed smoker, and parking for four cargo trailers. Um, this is the cargo trailers here in pink, uh, the smokers over here, uh, and the cooler pad, uh, the concrete pad with the cooler on top is over here. Um, in addition, a new outdoor walking cooler is proposed, which is to replace an existing outdoor walking cooler. Uh, the, sizes of the, the sizes of the trailers and the cooler, so we have two enclosed cargo trailers, which are four, uh, 13 foot by 6 foot. Uh, they're five feet in height. Uh, two other cargo trailers, which are 11 by six uh, feet and also five feet in height. And the walking cooler, as mentioned before, is eight foot by 14 foot and it's eight feet in height. Uh, half of the yard is to be for the parking of trailers and storage of items uh, unspecified for the applicant for a catering business on a proposed gravel surfacing. Uh, it is noted that a catering business is not a defined use under the town's co uh, town code's list of use definitions, um, but could be considered as an accessory use to the existing restaurant. Excuse me. Um, the planning board may wish to request a determination from the chief building inspector if the proposed use is considered uh, an additional second use separate from the restaurant or is an accessory use to the restaurant. A second commercial use on a commercially zoned lot is permitted, however, may require additional parking standards for a catering use, which is undefined at the moment in the town code. Uh, the applicant should submit a narrative of the usage of the trailers, including their relation to the existing restaurant use, frequency of use, and maintenance, if any, is required. Uh, it appears that the remaining half of the western yard portion is currently being utilized for the storage of various items and outdoor seating for the restaurant. Uh, aerials, aerials have indicated that the seating placement is recent sometime within the last three years. Uh, the outdoor seating for the restaurant could be related to the outdoor dining pilot program enacted by the town of East Hampton in, two, uh, in 2021. Uh, restaurants provided they obtain the appropriate permits from the town fire marshal can allocate dining seats outdoors due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the applicant should submit a narrative of the outdoor seating usage uh, regarding its usage uh, outdoor seating permits from the fire marshal if it is related to the outdoor dining program uh, and the permanency of the seating. Uh, if outdoor seating is to be permanent, the increased number of seating will need to meet site plan approval standards and should be considered as an expansion of the existing restaurant use. Uh, the parking for the residents and the restaurant appears, appears to be pre-existing uh, and the number of existing parking spaces is unclear and yet to be determined. Uh, the trailer parking may increase the, site, the site's parking requirements if it is determined by the building, the building inspector to be a second use. Uh, the existing parking appears to be located off-site and on the Maidstone Park Road right of way. Uh, in addition, there are two smaller parking areas located partially off-site along Richardson Avenue. Uh, the following are the parking requirements if the lot were to meet current zoning. So for a single family residence, it's two per residence. Uh, for a restaurant, is one per three permanent seats or one per th each three persons of rated capacity uh, plus one per employee per shift. Uh, 
uh, a floor plan from the ninth from a 1992 building permit indicates that the restaurant may have at least 44 seats. Uh, it is estimated that the parcel under current zoning would require at least 28 off street parking spaces, at least 26 for the restaurant use, which is not including parking for staff uh, and two spaces for a single family residence. It is recommended that the applicant submit a parking layout that illustrates the maximum number of parking spaces possible and existing and proposed parking calculations on the site plan. Uh, it is unlikely that multiple parking spaces could be situated on site given the parcel's limited lot area. Uh, the parcel is pre-existing non-conforming for side and rear yard setbacks uh, and in minimum lot size at uh, 6,899 square feet where 10,000 square feet is required for neighborhood business. I'm just gonna zoom in on the calculation numbers. Um, sorry, uh, we're gonna leave off. Uh, portions, of the, portions of the building are near the property line with the closest setback to a residence district being 3.9 feet on the Eastern side. Uh, the applicant's proposal will increase the pre-existing lot coverage from 3,167 square feet, which is 45.91%, to 3,455 square feet, which is about 50%, uh, where 2,759 square feet, 40%, uh, would be permitted as a new lot. Uh, similarly, for the existing total coverage, it would increase from about 69.4% to 85.46%, uh, where 70% is uh, normally permitted. Uh, the proposal for additional coverage would require two coverage variances from the Zoning Board of Appeals for exceeding lot coverage uh, and total coverage, total lot coverage. Uh, the residences uh, are located on the eastern here and south here and on the north here, uh, basically everywhere else. Um, it is noted that the proposed cooler uh, stockade, the stockade fencing and gates have been proposed to be near the property line. At the moment, the walking cooler and six foot fencing do not meet the required 10 foot accessory structure setbacks. Uh, the planning board has the ability to reduce accessory structure setbacks if it, if it were to find the structures were to be in the interest of good planning. Uh, no sanitary information has been submitted at the time of review. The existing, the existing sanitary system should be depicted on the site plan in addition to sanitary calculations. Uh, under Chapter 210-3-2, all non-residential properties that require site plan review pursuant to 255-6-30B, uh, 24, or 5 uh, will require a sanitary upgrade to a low nitrogen system. Um, it is, un it is unclear if the site plan will require an upgraded sanitary system as it is unclear if the proposed trailer parking uh, would increase the site's parking requirements. Um, it is noted that the additional outdoor seating, if it were to be permanent, would increase the parking site requirements, require approval from the Suffolk County Department of Health Services, and would trigger a sanitary upgrade if the sanitary system is not a low nitrogen system. Uh, there's no light fixtures that have been proposed or lighting plans that have been submitted at the time of review. Uh, all light fixtures must be fully shielded and meet and should meet the uh, the board's lighting policy. Um, it appears that the restaurant building contains fixtures in the front of the building that do not appear to be fully shielded. Uh, no landscaping has been proposed or landscaping plans have been submitted. Uh, the six foot high uh, stockade fences and gates would need uh, approval, additional approval from the Architectural Review Board. Uh, it appears that the trailers would be hidden behind the stockade fencing. However, the walking cooler may not be screened. Um, upon a site visit, it appears that a dumpster is placed on the property that is not fully screened uh, and should be depicted on the site plan. Uh, the proposed project will require the approval from the ARB, the Architectural Review Board. Um, and an application should be submitted if, they ha uh, if the applicants have not already done so. Uh, the stockade fencing, the cooler, and the dumpster are areas in which are most likely to have a, vi have a visual impact on the surrounding area, given their proximity to the property line. Uh, comments from the fire marshal uh, has stated that the submitted information is sufficient or not relevant to necessitate further review for fire protection. 
the project is a type two action pursuant to CICRA, uh in chapter 128 of the town code. Um, I have a minor typo here as that um, I recommend the planning board request lead agency, but that's not required because this is a type two action. Um, for site plan review, uh, items that should be submitted. So it's a narrative regarding the use of the trailers and outdoor seating, uh, survey slash site plan of parking layout with parking calculations. Uh, in conclusion, the application is incomplete and it is recommended that the applicant submit additional written details regarding the parking of the trailers and outdoor seating. Uh, the proposal will require two variances from the Zoning Board of Appeals, an increase in lot coverage and total lot coverage. Uh, the Planning Department recommends that the Planning Board request an interpretation from the Chief Building Inspector regarding if the proposed parking of the trailers is an accessory uh, is accessory to the restaurant or is considered a separate use. Uh, I'll be going over photos um, and so anyone can stop me at any time, but uh, that's all. Hey. Um, Mr. Girardi, now is your opportunity to speak on behalf of the application. You're muted, sir. You have to unmute yourself. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Rich Girardi Jr. My father is also Richard Girardi. Uh, we own the property together. Uh, well, he owns the property. I'm helping represent this. Uh, so re we really didn't get to get to an attorney as everyone knows how crazy it is right now trying to retain people like this. So we, the, just a little quick story. This all started um, when we owned the building, the tenant had just moved in in March from another restaurant that they moved out of. They had to bring the trailers there to unload all their restaurant contents. Um, somebody in the neighborhood had made multiple calls and complaints and kind of, uh, spark this whole situation. So we really, and the only way we were able to help get this tenant up and running for the season was to kind of move ahead and do whatever we could in the meantime, like fill out this application and, uh, you know, try to try to get the ball rolling in some way. So sorry for the, you know, not completely no. professional uh, situation here. Um, what we're trying to accomplish is, you know, most of everything you see on the property, these fences were existing and um, we're really just trying to acquire this additional parking for the cargo trailers. And, uh, you know, the walk-in refrigerator needed to be replaced because it was probably 30, 40 years old, falling apart. Uh, the concrete underneath it was starting to give out for the pad and it just was, you know, becoming an issue. So, we uh, removed the old one and put up the new walk-in cooler and um, you know, that sparked the stop work order um, when they called ordinance to come by. And we presented to Ann Glennon the fact that, because it's in, uh, the, I think when I met with Eric on site, said if this can be you know, approved, by Ann, there shouldn't be any issues uh, or need to really go through planning possibly. Uh, the CFO is explicit where it says, uh, you know, in the language, it says refer to the survey for other items. And, you know, on that survey, the original survey does show that walk-in cooler, but what she said that because in the language, it doesn't specifically say walk-in cooler, she can't approve it. And that's why that ended up here with you guys. So um, we did put a permit in. Right. We did put in a building permit because the person we're using for our permit expediting, Dan Casey, thought that that should be all it needed. So we submitted the permit and then we got kicked back. So, I mean, honestly, we were in such a big time crunch trying to get our tenant open. Um, you know, we we had to put the cooler in and then uh, the rest was pretty much, like I said, existing. The big thing was getting the trailers off the road because it is the town right of way. And this restaurant's never had uh, parking within its own property. So you know, we figured we, we'd put the trailers within the property for now um, to hopefully, you know, make more aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Mr. Droyer, may I ask a question? What what do you use the trailers for? So he uses the trailers to well, we don't. So we, we're not 100 because we don't run the restaurant. But from what he tells us, a lot of the additional storage of items that he needs, 
he keeps in those trailers because the basement of this restaurant's not very large. And he came from a, a very big building where he had tons of storage. So majority of what he uses for is storing. And he does do some catering on the weekends, I think. Um, off premise. Yeah, he does off premise catering with the trailers. Um, not all the time, but, uh, you know, I think well, he said in the peak season, twice a weekend. Or so. uh, are they are they using the trailers to to enlarge the restaurant effectively? Effectively, it, I guess you could say yeah. If you need additional space that you just can't find anywhere else, it's you know I guess it's an Storage. alternative to that. For yeah. Who is that speaking? Okay. Yeah, there's is there someone else speaking? speaking? Uh, this is Richard Senior. Oh, uh, all right, very well. All right. Um, okay. Do you have anything else you want to? Uh, in part to us? No. Can I make, can I make some comments? Uh, this is well, Richard Sr. How are you? Go right ahead. Thank you for hosting us. Uh, basically, what I want to say is this, I don't know if you're familiar with the property, but this has been... Oh, very much. Okay. It goes back a long time ago when it was Augusta's General Store at one point, then it was the Fat Flounder, and then it was mm -hmm. Michael's Restaurant for about 35 years. Um, Prior to the pandemic, uh, I had a tenant that's Luis, who ran the restaurant as Michael's. Um, prior to the pandemic, I basically had to take back the restaurant and, and clean it all up. And I went to put it on the market for a renter. And we were unable to get a renter, obviously, because of the pandemic. So we ran the restaurant as the Belmari restaurant for about a year and a half. And then we were able to get a tenant because he lost his tenancy someplace else. And uh, Eric Miller and his brother, Mark Miller, have been in the restaurant business for a long time. They've run Boswick's. And that was when it was Boswick's, it was Bay Kitchen Bar. They run uh, the catering place up by Boswick's on, on the highway. So they've been in the community for a long time being in the restaurant business. Uh, basically, it's it's been it's been restaurants for such a long time. We have never really had too many problems with the neighbors because it's been a restaurant. Most people know it as a restaurant and, and attend the restaurant. It's probably one of the last restaurants in Springs left at this point. So what I'm getting at is we we've owned this property for 14 years. In the climb of 14 years, we've never actually had any issues over there. We've always done a good job for the neighborhood, always kept the place nice. And, and most of the neighbors have no problem with it. it oh, this just happened and it, tended, it sounded like it happened because people were parking at the end. Uh, you're looking at that site there, you see that that, that fence is actually not, half on our property and not on the, we, we've moved that forward to stop people from parking there. It became a hazard because people were parking and going down to the beach, not even tending the restaurant. They were parking because they didn't have parking permits. So they couldn't park down the street. So they started, this has just happened for, during the pandemic. They were parking on the end there and they were sticking out and it got dangerous. So that was one of the reasons that the Drews originally called because they were worried. So many cars were coming down there for the pandemic. You know, it was a big area for people to come walk and. And, and, and they were parking on, our pro parking on the property, quite frankly, because they didn't have stickers to park down at the beach. And so we, one of the ways we cured that was because one of the things they said is you absolutely can't have people parking on the end anymore. That was one of the big factors. So we moved the fence to our property line so that no longer can somebody park on that corner and cause it to be a hazard. Because what happens is they come around that corner over there and it was a little bit like a blind turn. Yeah, like a blind turn. So we eliminated that by moving that to there. So we don't have that issue anymore. And that was one of the things that the ordinance guy brought up when we when this first happened. It had to do with, I, I believe it was Mrs. Drew, but I don't know for sure, who complained that people were coming around that turn and the cars were blocking the view. They're not there anymore. They can't park anymore. Now the trailers are inside, so it's safer. And, and she agreed to that when we spoke to her along the way, said, well, we're going to do it. We should... I just don't want. I just don't want it to be a hazard. So let I'm me, just pointing let me, that out. I know. Let me, let me, if you don't mind, my, I'd like to ask a question. The trailers, do they, they, do they come and go? Are they there in the same place all the time? Because I, I, I heard, I thought I heard you say something about that. that there's catering. There's a catering aspect. 
uh, they do off premises. They've done that in their in their restaurants before, and they do bring it to a. Let's say they cater a party for twenty five people. I don't know how many people. I'm just guessing. Mm-hmm. And, and basically, what they do is they load the food into the trailer. And they have all the health permits to do this, and then they bring it to the site that they're doing the party. It's off premise. They're doing no catering on premise. Okay, but they're, they're only they, doing restaurant use on premise. So the so the use of the trailer. Uh, I'm trying to figure out why you're using the trailer. And I'm hearing two reasons, and if there's two reasons, that's fine. I can't yeah. understand what it is. You're saying that the trailers are used to uh, give you more storage space or more for food prep space? Or- no, they can't food prep. They can no. store. Yeah. Well, what it is, and what we're, now that they've been operating, we've been getting a little kind of a better hold of what, it because we don't even really know for sure, obviously, the tenant. They know better than we do, but... It seems like two of the trailers for the most time sit there with um, additional like, you know, chairs and tables, things that they there's, they can't fit any more storage in the basement of the restaurant. They seem to be pretty, you know, fixed trailers for the most part. And then there are two trailers that they seem to take out on for off-premise catering and mm-hmm. um, seems to be just on the weekends. And it seems like they do it once or twice a weekend. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's both. And, that, and that, that's that's so that's how these new people are operating this this premises. Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. All right, let me let me move on if 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 I may. I'd like to because uh, we've been on this for quite a while. Let me let me uh, move on to the uh, board and uh, uh, Ed Crew. Ed. Uh, yeah. So this is a kind of an interesting and somewhat complicated set of circumstances here. I, I happen to live not far from here, um, and uh, I, I frequented all the restaurants that have been on this site o- over the years, and I also happen to use Maidstone Beach as my beach, so I'm very familiar with this stretch of road. And uh, I think, you know, it's fair to say that many people in the neighborhood, you know, this, this is a real institution in the neighborhood. You know, it's been here since the 70s as as Marco said in his report, uh, and it's been a variety of different different restaurants over over the years. Uh, and I was going to point out the thing that Mr. Gerardi did, which is that in, in the last year since the pandemic, many people who don't have East Hampton Town parking stickers park for the beach very near here, right? Because the you know, need for a permit begins 200 yards up Maidstone Park Road from Harbor Boulevard. So th- there was already some, you know, parking going on in this in this neighborhood that was in excess of what people were used to. And then, um, because the uh, the operator of, of this restaurant availed himself of the, uh, the dining pilot program, you know, has added some additional seats outside. The restaurant is very popular. So that has just sort of exacerbated this parking issue. And we're not here today to really discuss the parking issue, uh, but I think that you know it, it has sort of created a little a little bit of an issue in the in the neighborhood, and uh, create some slight complications for moving this application forward. You know, in that even though there's a CO from 2005 that basically, you know, legalizes everything that's on that survey. Um, which is most of what's depicted on this survey that you're looking at. Um, you know, but, but interestingly enough, over the years, despite the fact that there have been many building permits issued, there has never been a site plan review, right? There's never been a calculation of required parking. And I think, um, I think it's pretty clear that there's really virtually no space for on-site parking, none. I mean, even even the space that's now occupied by the that's proposed to be occupied by the trailers, which in fact is occupied by trailers, and the cooler. You know, we're legalizing something that's we're look, looking to legalize something that's already there. Um, it is really it's not really it, it's not appropriate for parking. There's some topography changes. It's just it's just not someplace where parking can easily go. So, I guess the conundrum here is really. Um, Needing to, uh, so I, I guess the crux of this really is Anne Glennon's sense of whether this is an accessory use to a restaurant or a second use. And whether or not, if it is an accessory use, right, which I, my understanding from the operator who I spoke to, I ran into and spoke to a few days ago, and I think, you know, Richard, you, you indicated to you, you'd spoken to her and she seems to feel as though this is an accessory use to a restaurant. Um, would 
would that fact and the existence of a valid CO obviate the need for a future site plan review and having to go through kind of the agony of, uh, of trying to get a variance for, for parking? Because clearly, you know, that's, it's never going to happen on site. So I think, you know, we really, we need to hear officially from Ann on this subject. You know, is this an accessory use to a restaurant or is this a secondary use? And what does that really mean in terms of how we need to proceed, right? Um, you know, everything that's on this proposal is there already, right? Um, the one thing that isn't depicted here is the fact that where those trees are shown on the Western side of the property, um, you know, there is a picnic area that you saw a photograph of earlier where there are probably nine or 10, you know, picnic tables outside, which has sort of dramatically, uh, you know, changed the number of seats at the restaurant. So, yeah, so I guess, so really the, the key question I think is, you know, as I said, is this an accessory used to a restaurant? Uh, is any kind of more formal site plan review required here? Um, and what and what does that mean, you know, in terms of this parking situation? Let me ask you, how do you feel about a narrative? Yeah, we need a narrative. What, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I apologize. I, I, asked, the, I asked the board member, um, Mr. Mr. Krug, whether he thought we would benefit from a narrative. Oh, narrative, I'm sorry. Okay. I an explanation of what the... Uh, of how the operation is uh, being conducted right now, and uh, what the plans are for the future. Right. And, you know, there there are there are a, a number of moving parts to it. We've got the tables. We've got the the, the, the uh, trucks. We've got the uh, cooler. We've got all you know, and, and it's all in the context of a uh, of a use that you know doesn't have parking. Where if it were anywhere else in the town, it would have. A lot of parking, so yeah. um, you know there's a lot. There are a lot of moving parts here. All right, let me. Um, Ed, did you have anything else you wanted to? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. I I have a question. Um, when they allowed uh, outdoor seating, I thought they still had to keep the the forty no the forty four seats. Um, they weren't allowed to add outdoor seating and keep all their indoor seating. That you know they're pretty much allowed those 44 seats that were, you know, on their depiction of the interior. Yeah, that is a really good question. I don't, I don't really that, know the ins and outs correct. of that program. Yeah, that's, that's that correct. is correct. That is, that's correct. It, it yes. seems like it would Karen's be. Karen's right, yeah. So, are, they operating, are they operating the indoor seating and the outdoor seating? But actually, you're wrong. The, the seating, the health department seating is more than 44 seats. I, it's right on the wall that's put up by the, by them. And I believe it's 78, I'd have to, uh, it's been a while, 78. And that's been like that for as long as I've owned it and prior to me owning it, they actually took some seats out of the inside Yeah. and uh -huh. they put them outside. So they didn't increase, they did take some interior seats out that were allowed by health department and they did put them out. And then the town, from what I'm told through the fire marshal gave all these restaurants, I don't know if this is permanent or temporary or part-time, whatever it's gonna be, I don't know. But they gave them some, they helped, they're trying to help the restaurants out because of the pandemic. So they gave them some additional outdoor seats. But, the, but actually he still doesn't exceed because he took some seats out inside, substantially number, yeah. and he put some outside. And the sign that's on the, t on the wall that's in there from the health department is 70 something, not, not 44. Well, okay. this, this is one of the, if I may say, this is one of the issues here is that I'm, in fact, Marco, I'm not sure where you got the 44. I don't see any documentation anywhere about the number of seats. Yeah, I'll, I'll if I can clarify that, and um, to the, to Mr. Gerardi, so this is Eric Chance from the planning department. Uh, since there is in fact no recent or ever a site plan approval um, for this property, there's nothing established um, in front of the planning board um, as far as the number of seats. Normally what we would do in this situation is go by what the fire marshal has as the rated occupancy. Um, I'm sure they have records of it and we will look into that. I think uh, it seems everybody's pretty clear. Um, the pilot program does not allow you to increase the number, uh, the total number of seats that you're allowed 
um, at the facility, at the restaurant, um, but it does allow, previously you were only allowed to have 30% of your, of your um, total seating be outdoor seating. The pilot program or the COVID program, it's not really a pilot anymore, um, allows you to put 100% of it outdoors. So um, we will look into that with the fire marshals. We'll see what the rated capacity is and what they have as far as the seating chart. We'll see, um, as Marco noted in the memo, the fire marshal, um, when uh, restaurants do apply to put uh, extra seating outdoors, they have to get approval from the fire marshal. And the fire marshal has seating charts and records that, that indicate what they're allowed uh, as far as those numbers go. We'll, we'll get that information for you um, for the next time. Just so you know, he did do that. The fire okay. marshal did get an application. They put the application in properly. So everything is documented. Okay, great. So just so you know. Yeah. I just want to add that I did include a CD chart from, I believe is from uh, the building department from 1992 that is in the memo itself. It's the last page. Uh, I've counted the 44 seats from there. That, that's that's okay. all I, where I counted oh, okay. the seats from. Okay. In terms of rated occupancy, it might be more, of course, because that's just occupancy. It's not really seating, but uh, that's just the, I, I don't know what they have currently in terms of um, what they filed for today, but that, that, that's that's all I have. Yeah. It is Marco. Yeah. Marco. Is there a number in the uh, CO? Uh, I don't. No. 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 Lou, Lou had a question for Marco. Yeah, yeah I just I just want to get clarification, Marco, on uh, the number of parking spaces that you uh, calculated based on the number of seats, which you have is 44 seats, and it's three uh, three seats per parking space, so one parking space for every three seats. That that calculates to 15 for the restaurant. How did you get 26? Uh, I might have done it wrong, possibly. Um, 44 divided by three, I might have done it incorrectly, sorry. Okay. And by the way, does the, doesn't doesn't the oh I think I might have I'm sorry I might have also done it by uh, I think I might have done it by rated capacity um, because the capacity was about seventy I don't remember off the top of my head but it was around seventy persons at least I think seventy six I believe it's on seventy six so I because yeah. it's either or it says one per three seats or one per right. three seats of rated capacity so I think I did that number instead um, but that's not even including you know, uh, staff or, uh, yeah, staff, I don't know how much. So or, or parking for the residents, right? Doesn't it, uh... There's two more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also the staff, that doesn't include the staff. Right. As, as you pointed out, Marco. Yeah. Yes. How did, how is the residents used? Well, as long as we have the owners here, is it, is it the, is the restaurant operator live there? Or is it a separate family? He or? lives there. Yeah, the restaurant operator lives there with his family. Uh, does any uh, board member have any further comment or question? So we can move on. Uh, I do. Go ahead, Kathy. Is there still a basement apartment? It's all part of the main residence. The basement apartment under the restaurant is part of the main residence it's no, been it's not under the restaurant though it, it's under the the residence the restaurant yeah. part's just unfinished it's just square well, unfinished parking, basement the, why uh, I, I don't think the parking the number on the parking matters in this case i uh, think it's 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 pre-existing without parking so right yeah. but i'm trying to establish if there's a second party renting the basement apartment oh, okay. apart from the residence that is yeah, occupied by the restaurant owner. What was the answer to that? I what? haven't heard. Sorry, what was that? Is, is there a, a, a secondary tenant in the basement? Yes, yes. They're related to the people living downstairs. There are people living downstairs, but I believe they're related to the tenant. It's all the same family. Yeah. Okay. So how many? All right. I mean, I understand that this is pre-existing non-conforming with respect to parking, but I think it's an important landmark for us to assess how many people are actually using this building as a residence. Five. So there are only five 
Yeah, that's all it is. It's just throughout it's, the top and it's bottom. Eric, Eric, his wife, his son Adam, and and two other and another two other people. And that's it. Uh -huh. Five. There's only five people. That's the least part of it. In the past, uh, yeah. not with me, but people before owned it. You know, before I took over, they used to rent it separately all the time. But I try to keep it as one. Right. It just seems like. Um, anyway, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a lot. It's 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 a lot happening on this lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's been like, but unfortunately, it's been like that for forty some odd I understand. years. I, I didn't understand. start. I didn't start it, and I'm trying to keep it as clean and nice. And I, you know, I I'm trying to keep everybody that. informed. Yeah, I recognize that. I'm really just trying to further my understanding of the demands on this lot and what it how it influences the neighborhood sure i, th I think our dark question is is this an intensification of use well that's where uh, i'm yeah, headed yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me let me since that that has been raised um kathy, kathy do you have anything else because i want to um uh, move not that. not at the moment okay. I, I might later this is the situation that we face with i hope the applicant will understand we need to uh get a a, a sense from the uh Chief Building Inspector, whether they consider this a secondary use, an accessory use, whether it's an intensification or an expansion, we need the building inspector to weigh in on this. Now, ordinarily what happens, or the, the policy that we've been, been implementing is that the uh, is that the planning, the planning board prepares a letter to the uh, building inspector and uh, the, the, with our concerns. We will present that letter to you so that you understand what it is we're asking of the building department. But in the, it, 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 the, the, the I used the word narrative before, uh, you know, and I said that there's a lot of moving parts here. I think, and any of the board members who disagree, please say so if you disagree. But I think that that the the preparation of our questions and the response by the building uh, inspector will be. Um, Far more useful if we have a narrative from you or from you and your tenant as to uh, the various um, plans that the plans that you have for the various things that you're doing on the property, the tables, the the outside tables, the uh, the um, trucks, or the you know whatever they're called, the the, the you know the. Vans. Yeah, they don't have they don't have a motor. They just well, they don't have a motor. Yes, yeah. but, but the they, do, yeah. they do. You you said that two of them go every weekend. So they, you know that that's that, that is something that I myself would like to know more about. Uh, okay, and, and I'd like to be able to, to characterize that uh, not characterize, but you know I'd like to have your characterization of that so that when the when the building inspector makes her determination, uh, you know she can take into consideration what it is you say. So, and then also there's the business with the, um, with the uh, uh, refrigerator. So how long do you think it might take you to put together some kind of a, and it doesn't have to be anything super elaborate. I mean, frankly, if you had an attorney or a planner working with you, they'd know exactly what needs to be done. But how long do you think it might take you to put together a narrative? That uh, I mean, do you, do you want us to get an attorney? Is that what you're saying? I, mean, I can't tell Tom, okay. We don't have to, right? We could do it. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to have an attorney, but the kind of information that I think that needs to be in a narrative for the building inspector is, are things like what are stored in the trailers? Are the trailers going on and off the property? If so, how often? Um, you know, seating wise, what are where are they at as far as indoor and outdoor seating? Um, okay. You know that sort of thing and i mean i i think you can take as much time as you need but you know i would say if you can get it to us within 30 days or oh uh, i think we could do that uh -oh. for sure we um, could definitely do that the, the and, sooner, let's, let's put it this way the sooner you're able to get something to us uh, uh, that, okay. we, that we can then use to frame out a letter to the building inspector the sooner the process will move sure and, okay, uh, we can do that. And, and 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 the issues that you know that are have all been engendered by what you're doing can be addressed in the planning process. So okay, uh, uh, that's very I, fair. Can I say, uh, Mr. Mr. Garardi, uh, the planning department would be uh, happy to help you um, craft that if you want to. 
check with us the list of items that we feel should be addressed um, or that the plan oh, sure. feels should be addressed. Um, we're we're happy to help you with that. Who's who's speaking right now? Just so Eric I know. Chance of the planning. Department. Okay, hi Eric. Hi. Okay, I got you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Sam, Sam, could I just add one last thing? Go um, ahead. Our, Go right ahead. Uh, this hasn't been mentioned uh, during the course of this uh, process, and you know I just want to bring it up because to me it's important. When I see an old building like this that's been operating for decades. The first thing that I think of is the sanitary system, that it's not, you know, that it may, you know, I'm not, I'm not speculating as to what it is, but uh, in a way I am because it is an old building and I'm afraid that we're dealing with uh, a sanitary system that's just not adequate. And it, that to me causes pollution and that's much more important than the parking issue that we've been talking about and everything else. So in the narrative, I would like to know what kind of sanitary system there is. And of course, as Marco pointed out in his memo, if Van Glennon decides that this is a change of use, then uh, the applicant will need, is, will be obligated to uh, up, upgrade the sanitary system. But I just want to point out to the applicant that that's a very important issue at least as far as I'm concerned. Let me just address one thing on that real quickly, because I agree with you, but we're not really increasing the number of people with the trailers. The trailers really just are more for off-premises than on let me Let me suggest that it, the, 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 this is a more nuanced, in my opinion, and you sure. know, everybody can have their own opinion, but the, my, my view on it is it's more nuanced than I think uh, uh, is being uh, the credit is being given for. That's a bad, that's poor in English, but I, I, I just think that there are many levels to this, and uh, you, you know, the, the planning department will help you. Um, but uh, you know, this is this is this colloquially speaking, there's a lot to deal with, there are many moving parts. And, and, and they all affect and impact each other to some degree. And the, but they ultimately all lead to the determination that the build, chief building inspector is going to make, which is really going to guide the way in which this process continues for you. So, okay. And we, uh, okay. I'm not being too cryptic there. But, Sam? Uh, go ahead, Randy. I want to wrap this one up, please. Yeah, um, I, I, would, I would ask if we could if we could have a copy of the health department um, approval, the health department uh, permit on this property, just to clarify what the the health department considers uh, is going on here too. And uh, I don't know if the applicant could provide that or if Eric can get it. Or... We already had, they already had somebody out there from the health department. So they just got everything up to date. So we can get that to you quickly. Yeah, the more Not a problem. The more information that we have, the more information you put into the narrative, the more, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, the more comprehensive and appropriate a result you'll get. We're going to get all that for you guys. All of that. Eric, Eric, Eric. I'm going to wrap this up with, the, I, I, I don't think, the, 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 looking at the questions that we have, we need to go really beyond the, the first one because the second one is about, the information regarding the use and permanency of the outdoor seating, that's going to go into the narrative as well. Okay. Um, the applicant provide a plan of the parking layout. Again, th th that's, th th that is also part of the narrative, but we also, in this particular case, because of the pre-existing uh, parking issue, uh, you know, again, uh, needs to be treated particularly, particularly suited to this application. Okay. Right. Sam, can I just add one yeah. thing? Because Marco did put it in the memo that no sanitary is depicted on the plan, mm -hmm. which, you know, leans toward what uh, Lou is saying. And then it wraps in what Randy's saying that the health department, what their understanding of what the septic is there is what we should know. And that could be a really old document. So um, I understand yeah. the health department just came and made an on-site visit, but I think these are specific, this is specific information that we'll need. I'm sure Eric can help direct the applicant. Sure. All right, very well. Thank you Thank very you. much. And, Thank uh, you guys. Have a, good have a great evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care.
Bye bye. Okay, the last item before we go to the uh, two the two rezoning yeah, issues yeah. is the Nick Cohen Artist Studio. I'm looking for Mr. Catalano, who is his. Hi, Sam. Hi, hi, Mr. Cohen. How are you? Is, I is, think is... Mark had to step offline okay. a little bit ago. Thomas, can we go forward without counsel here as long as the applicant's here? Um, I mean, if if Nick is comfortable going forward, then I'd say go ahead. Okay. All right. Now, I uh, just want to remind everyone before we get into this one that you know, Mr. Cohen's got uh, two balls in the air. <laughs> with us, <laughs> and, uh, good, good and uh, we're, 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 uh, that'll be the end of the descriptive process on my part. Uh, the one that we've got tonight is the artist studio application. Last time we had the um, site plan review for the uh, land, so we have um, uh, on this application Eric uh, is going to be on behalf of the planning department. Randy, you're the uh, planning board on this. And uh, Mr. Cohen, after uh, Eric speaks, uh, if you'd like to speak or if Mr. Catalano's gotten back, he can speak. Uh, and then uh, we'll go over to Randy and we can hopefully address this one with some dispatch. So go ahead, Eric. Sure. Um, there's not too much new from the last time the board saw this. Um, this is an application for a 1,094 square foot artist studio on a slightly larger than half acre parcel. Um, the board previously discussed um, the fact that since this is an accessory structure over 600 square feet, um, they will need to find that um, the application meets three criteria. Uh, the first, that the property constraints make it difficult or impractical to, to construct the studio that is attached to the principal building or to construct a um, accessory structure of less than 600 square feet. Uh, two, that the applicant has justified the need for a larger studio um, based on their art form and scope of work. And three, that the size is compatible with the residential neighborhood. Um, the board should discuss that this evening and determine whether or not you feel those three criteria can be met. Additionally, um, I apologize, I thought I was screen sharing, but hopefully now I am. Um, this is the site plan sketch that the applicants provided. You can see the proposed artist studio in the northern corner of the property. Um, the board should also discuss whether or not that location is appropriate. Another issue that was already discussed was um, noise uh, from um, the, the artist medium, um, which is sculpting and involves um, machinery that, that can generate um, quite high levels of noise. However, they have demonstrated, a no, uh, they've submitted a noise uh, compliance report, which demonstrates compliance with uh, chapter 185 of the town code, um, that the measurements that were taken were at 30 feet. Um, so the board may want to discuss um, as a condition that uh, the studio be at least 30 feet from any adjoining property line. Um, one outstanding issue is that um, we do not have any information as to where the gray water from the sink, um, how it will be um, contained. We're assuming a single dry well will be sufficient, um, but that information has not been provided. Um, additionally, there should be a floor plan um, that has a notation uh, that says no bath, shower, toilet, or plumbing other than for a sink is permitted. Um, that's a, a quote notation that should be added to a floor plan. The planning board has established that as a requirement on all of the previous artist studio applications. Um, it should be simple just to come up with a, a general floor plan that includes that notation and illustrates where a dry well would be. Um, the main issue here, um, which was discussed as, as part of the site plan um, portion of this project, uh, is the issue of clearing of the, of the lot here at Lafayette Place. The applicants are proposing revegetation along the front um, of, uh, of Lafayette Place of native vegetation. They've replaced a stockade fence that was going to um, be behind that um, band of revegetation with a four foot um, post and rail fence as the planning board had requested. Uh, additionally, they've illustrated, you can see those two uh, red circles in the northern corner. Um, they're proposing um, five to six foot Leyland Cypress um, in a a staggered row, I'm assuming, um, to screen the artist studio from those two uh, neighboring residential properties. 
Uh, the board should have a discussion over whether or not that screening and that revegetation is sufficient. Um, and those are really the outstanding issues at this point. And once those are resolved, uh, the application will be complete and uh, ready to be scheduled for a public hearing. Very good. Okay, uh, is uh, Mr. Catalano back yet? I don't believe he's going to be coming back. He's actually out of <laughs> town and oh, okay. he's seeing right. family and out of town. So, All right, Mr. Cohen, then uh, you're Just free to say whatever you like. Uh, I mean, I'm here to work with you guys. I am here feeling privileged to be here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been a long run. We've been working towards it. I made some mistakes, but that's the learning curve of life. So whatever you guys got for me, let's just discuss it and hopefully we end with a happy note. I don't know. <laughs> All right, very well. well. I appreciate the attitude. So yeah. <laughs> Randy, uh, why don't you uh, take it on? Hey, Nick. Hey, Randy. How's it going? <laughs> um, so I have a question for you. Uh, why not have the studio closer to your house? Uh, like on on that on that line so so the closest neighbor would be you totally so yeah. oh i'm ready you can keep speaking i don't i'm not used to you no. let me know when you want an answer <laughs> no go ahead that's a so that's initial a... initially i i believe it's been a long time but initially i think the first plan was actually on the south side uh which was on the other side of the property and then we had a conversation and then the board kind of said, why would you have it over there? Why don't you move it to the other side of the property? So we moved it to the other side of the property. And when we were laying it out, there was the idea of, well, one, we would have to have a driveway to access the studio that would then consume a large portion of this property in order to access it. Mm hmm and then if in the future we ever wanted to put a second home on the property, it kind of really, you know, maybe makes that harder, takes okay. up more of our land use. So I tried to position it in a, in a place that would be, you know, that made the most sense. I'm conscious of my neighbors. Uh, I see my neighbors often. I've discussed this with my neighbors. And I let them know, and I'm trying to be as transparent as possible. And this seemed like the most sensible place. At okay. the end of the day, if we need to move it off, I mean, I know what my setbacks are and I, I exceeded them just so that we gave more you know, room between me and the neighbors. But if it needs to go an extra three feet, so it's not 25 or whatever that number is, I, I can't actually see it on this survey, but I think it's 25 from the right and 18 from the back. My neighbor that is on the back of that property has maybe a two acre parcel or something like this. And the back of that property for the first maybe 80 or 90 feet is untouched. Um, untouched in a lot of green and a lot of you know there's there's a lot of room between that back lot line and their actual house the one neighbor that's close to it is that house on lafayette place which i'm very conscious of the fact that we jumped the gun and cleared the land and i've been you know feeling terrible that now this person doesn't really have any good screenage anymore so through the next steps, whatever I can do to make them happier about what's going on, I'm there to do that just for my own consciousness. Like, I just want to make sure everybody's, you know, in the neighborhood and everybody's together. So, <laughs> okay. Well, I think Eric makes a good point that the, the noise readings that we got from your guy uh, were at 30 feet. And the, but the setback from the building to the property line on the proposed site plan is less than that. So it raises the question whether uh, whether the building should be oh, 30 true. feet so we can rely on those, those numbers or if we need a new reading at the closer distance. Well, 
I would be, it's 25 feet now. I have no issue moving at five feet. I mean, I do think that it does make a difference if we're moving at 20 feet or 25 feet because that could change the site into the future. But I think that five feet is totally understandable. I also, I, I can't, I don't have that sound reading in front of me, but I believe they took two readings. I think that they took a reading at 30 feet. And then I think that they took a reading right from the door with the doors shut. You know, I think we tried to give an array of a spectrum. Now, again, at 30 feet, I would completely be compliant to move that five feet. Well, that, that I think that, Eric, do you, uh, does that make, does that make sense to you that we do the 30 feet on both, both uh, setbacks there? I mean, I think it's something that would ensure that the documentation that they submitted, um, you know, that the, the location of the studio is, um, you know, matching up with the documents that were submitted to the official file, because the reading was taken at 30 feet. It was taken with the doors open and closed. Um, and the, as Mr. Cohen um, was pointing out, and the readings that they got were 58 dBA and 48 dBA um, with the doors open and closed respectively. Um, and both were taken at 30 feet from the property line. Um, and the, um, the maximum allowable noise output at night, which is the more restrictive at a property line is 50 dBA. So again, the numbers with the doors open and closed at 30 feet were 58 and 48. So 48 is very close to 50. Um, it is in compliance, but it's in compliance at 30 feet with the doors closed. So, so we probably, if, if Nick, if you're okay with it, I think we want to err on the side of not bothering the neighbors so that, that um, increasing that one to 30 feet off the line, I think would help. Um, hey, Randy. Just yeah. before you continue, because I'm confused and I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm reading this correctly or incorrectly, because the way I read it was that the noise measurements were taking, were, are taken 30 feet from the property line. Now, I thought that they stood 30 feet from the property line, not on the other side of on the other on the other property so it's 30 feet from the property line that divides nick's property with his neighbor well, and they took it on understanding... the sagaponic luke the, what? The, the readings were taken in sagaponic at nick's studio there so oh oh so I they see. moved 30 feet because i think in the town code there's something that says something about a certain per, feet off the property line and I, I think it's 20 feet or 15 feet, to be honest. I don't, I'm not 15, sure. 15. It's so 15. So back. technically, you're supposed to be 15 feet with a decibel reading of 50, or I, my numbers might be a little wrong. But what they did was they went 30 because I said, look, I'm looking not to put this studio right on the property line anyways. I don't want to make a neighborhood feel more encroached by my studio. So I'm willing to move it off. So I said, let's just take a reading from 30 feet. Now, I don't know, because I knew that 15 feet was what you guys asked, what is in code. Um, but so again, I'm willing anyways to move it 30 feet. The one feeling of mine is that the 30 feet from the one house to the right, I completely understand and have no issue with at all, which I have, I think, written at 25 feet or so. The other property has, I mean, I'm willing to do it. Like, I'm not saying I'm not. It's just that the other property has maybe 200 feet to anything that they ever, or 100 feet to anything they ever access anyways, because it's all natural growth so it's all like leaves they're never really back that far so if i could have the studio positioned at that 18 feet it leaves us a little bit more room off of the road so i it's all here or there i mean i'm just trying to like place it in the right place with you know taking everybody into consideration 
if that makes well, sense. I, got, I guess, you know, for me, the, the noise readings um, are, well, first of all, we, we don't know that the, the noise measurements were, uh, were taken on, on a day when you're doing your loudest work for example. I, yes, you don't, but I, I can assure you, I did as much noise as I possibly could so that I wasn't like misleading myself or yeah, anything. You know what? I, I, I don't think we need, look, the applicant gave us a, a, a reading. I don't think we need to go into, you know, the, 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 the veracity of the testing. I mean, he's, he, he's presented it to us and we can accept it for what it's worth. I mean, it isn't at the property itself. You know, maybe we want to get into issues about whether the property in Santa Panic is uh, top, top, topographically the same as this property, whether it's, uh, whether it's wooded the same way, and it probably isn't. So, you know, I'm willing to accept this reading for what it is as a guidepost for our application. We really shouldn't be bogged down in this any further. Uh, well, Sam, the, the proposal to resolve it is that that we have the building 30 feet off each property line. That mm -hmm. solves the problem. That, then there's no discussion about... Then I know. say, let's so, then I'm willing, I would say I'm willing to do that if that solves the problem. I'm all about solving the problem here. <laughs> if okay. that, that does it, I'm happy to abide. What we really should be working on is, you know, the size of the studio and, and whether it's, you know, whether we find that find it warranted or not. That's, that's where there's, I think, where this conversation is supposed to be going. So, I the other the other thing I would mention is that I see on the survey there is actually a dry well shown there. I we did draw a dry well in. Okay, and then the I think the, my mistake. I missed that. Sorry. Okay. The source of uh, Nick, the source of your water it would be a your, rain catch. Rain catch. So you're going to have a cistern or some? A cistern inside the building is a 50-gallon drum that sits about roof level inside, and it just comes off the roof. Because really, it's really just for, you know, it's not... Washing your hands or something. It's, it's not, yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. do we have water? Here's some water. <laughs> and then we don't have to run, a, you know, and that's what I actually operate with now in my studio in Sagaponic. So it's worked for me fine. So I, didn't I wonder... We may we may want to note to that fact that the the source of the of the water is a cistern with collecting from the roof, and then it explains why there's no public water hookup and no well on the site. Correct. Um, yeah. So uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, the uh, the standard. We've been using a standard clause in the uh, covenants about no toxic way, no toxic materials down the sink. Yeah, or, we, uh, I, I was going to suggest that we follow that along. You know, we, we, uh, just so that people understand, you know, this is maybe the fifth or sixth of uh, one of these artist studio applications, and we seem to be uh, developing protocols as we are, as we're going. Uh, and that is a good one. And I would Definitely. say that we should employ it in this. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, we, uh, we were talking earlier today, uh, with Eric and uh, the planning staff and uh, Kathy and I, and, uh, you know, there, there, there may be more uh, rational ways of, uh, I don't mean in the sense of rational versus irrational, but rational in the sense of, you know, that we know how these things are going to be handled uh, going forward. And we may be coming up with uh, you know more definite ways in which the uh, um, artist studio applications are going to be addressed. Yeah, I mean the the boiler, the the toxic no toxic materials down the drain, I think should be part of our boilerplate. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. Well, the boilerplate may become more extensive than just that. So, all right. Do we all, Randy? Do you have anything else, or is that nope. it? Nope. Nope. All right. So let me ask: Does the board find that that the that a detached artist studio of the size proposed is warranted. Do we have agreement on that? And I'll yes. note, by the way. Yes. Yes, 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 yes all around. Uh, Jody, I'll uh, note that uh, Ian had to leave. Okay, so, um, so there's only six of us now.
Uh, all right, do we, uh, should the floor plan identify how the wastewater will be contained? And I guess the answer to that as well, yes, because we, that's what we're doing. Yes, and also, as Randy pointed out, with, that it's a, a, a rain catch, that a cistern is the source of the water. Yeah, we did mention that in, in the context of the waste. Yes. Water, okay. water, water out. And, and, uh, and the uh, landscape, how should uh, landscaping and revegetation be addressed? Don't we need a landscape plan? Not Nothing elaborate, but the spacing and the size. And I, I On the survey, I put five to six, 10 feet on center. Um, okay. And, yeah. and, you know, to be honest, we'll probably plant more. I mean, you know, this is, I, I plant trees around my property a lot and, uh, and we definitely, I, I prefer the screenage. So this would be the minimum. I mean, I, I, I would say normally, you know, the planning department would advocate as we do for all site plans, um, a full, you know, landscaping plan, revegetation plan, um, this does have a site plan aspect to it about the clearing, um, but the notation there um, references the correct plant spacing. I believe I've already stated the um, natural habitat type that would be part of the revegetation. The applicants are noting the um, type and height of the screening plants. I think perhaps in this case, as long as we say, if it does get approved that we have a condition of approval that spells out what will be planted a, and at what spacing in the reveg area. And then something to the effect of, you know, a staggered row of five to six foot tall Leland Cypress along the, you know, Northeastern and Northwestern um, sides of the artist studio to screen, you know, the neighboring residences. If we include that and we're specific enough it, it, with that in a condition of approval, um, that may be sufficient, but that's up to the board to oh. determine. And then I just, I just had one. Just, well, sorry, Patty, but but Eric, and then we also have our typical uh, condition that that the 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 items planted will be maintained. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's an ongoing obligation. Part of my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm signed up, man. I love it. He's a property <laughs> owner. Come on. It's a part of my life. I get more gratification from that than, and you can talk to my neighbors. I'm out there doing, and they, they we see each other, and it's part of, it's it's a good thing. And I'm- You're the it. ideal, Nick, you're the ideal applicant. I, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give them all that credit. All right. Anybody else have anything or can we now move I, I did have I did have one question that I wanted to ask and hello Nick. Um, good to see you. Um, I, I just noticed that the uh, decibel levels at 30 feet are 58. Um, they range from 58 to 50, 48. And 58 is over the nighttime level. So um, I guess the thing I'd ask is if you're going to use that noisier equipment you do it with the doors closed or you know i don't know if that is a is that a doors closed reading because it would be eight decibels over the 50 that's required at night good point kathy you know um so and and look i you know i strongly support your application you know i know you're a good person i've known you for a really long time <laughs> and um I don't, I don't have any question about, you know, your intentions, but uh, this is something that we're, we should be, you know, paying attention to. Completely. And I'm, I'm on board. I mean, I really wouldn't be operating that at night. And yeah. I think the decibel thing was the 58 and 48 was the door open and door closed. Right. And if I were to be operating, I would have the door shut. Honestly, even if I was doing something noisier than normal, I would shut the doors for my neighbors. I'm not. Right, right. Gonna... Well, I, yeah, I know you to be a considerate person, so I would expect that, but it, it but yeah, needed to be that. mentioned, I think, in terms of those readings that were reported that, you know, it is eight decibels over the evening uh, permitted sound level. Thank you, Kathy. All right, we're going to wrap this one up. And uh, can I, can I, Sam, just to summarize and be clear, um, especially for Nick. So based yeah, on what I'm hearing from the board, um, we would need a revised um, site plan sketch that shows the artist studio being 30 feet from each property line. 
I think there was consensus on the board on that. Mm -hmm. And then also just a floor plan with the standard notation that there'll only be a sink. And then I think um, once you do receive those, then the application would be complete and ready to be scheduled for a public hearing. Thank you for adding that, Aaron. And well, and Nick, so, so, so uh, you know, there'll be a letter, it'll go to Mr. Catalano explaining those we need uh, to do. two matters that Eric just brought out so that you so that you have a guidepost of what needs to be done. Can I? All right, say, thanks. Can I say one? Never mind. Uh, thank you guys very thank much. You. Okay. I know you're very busy. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Bye, Nick. Bye, guys. Thank you. All right. All right. We're going to, we, we have one item on the uh, regular meeting, um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that and we'll wrap with that. But before we do that, we have two um, uh, rezoning for comment and recommendation to the, to the town board. Um, just so the uh, folks who uh, may wish to speak with respect to that, you know, the, ordinarily, I said this at the beginning of the meeting, ordinarily we don't, while, we, while we've been on Zoom, don't take public comment, uh, spoken comment, we take written comment, of course, uh, but because this is a zone change and it's not an application, and we're basically only going to hear from Eric um, on it, and then we'll have our discussion. If there are any people who are affected by the zoning change and wish to speak, uh, we'll hear them. I would ask them to keep their comments to a minimum uh, and bear in mind that we know that the matter has been on in front of the town board and there was actual noticed, theoretically, noticed public hearing comments and uh, uh, and, and I don't know if every board member uh, has heard those comments, uh, but we all, we have a link and I, I believe m most, if not all, have seen the comments that were made before the uh, town board. Um, and uh, again, we ordinarily don't pay, we don't, you know, we, we're listening to this because it was public comment. And when I think we listen to town board meetings, <laughs> But in this case, we listened to public comments made at a public hearing I should say, at the town board. So with that, uh, sorry for the uh, prolixity of that uh, explanation. Uh, Eric, you want to do, you're going to do first the uh, 395 Panago Road and then the Wayne Scott Limited business overlay? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the board should um, discuss each one separately. You know, we'll handle 395 first and then well, uh, Wayne Scott. First, that that, that uh, had uh, that, that, that should that should theoretically be quicker. This yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview here. Um, I did submit a letter to the town board, which was attached to the memo um, that I sent to you uh, recently to the planning board. Uh, this is an application to add an affordable housing overlay designation on a roughly 12-acre property. Um, this property is situated on Panago Road, right by the intersection of the Panago Road portion of Montauk Highway with Skimhampton Road. Uh, hopefully you can see the aerial photograph um, of aerial photograph of the general area. To the far left on your screen along Montauk Highway is Town Hall. Um, so this is very, very close to Town Hall. Uh, the parcel is highlighted in teal. Um, again, this is a roughly 12 acre parcel. This was purchased by the town recently and the town in its resolution and in its uh, public hearing um, when they were deciding to purchase this property um, did so with the understanding that seven acres of the property would be for uh, municipal and affordable housing um, purposes and that the remaining five acres would um, be open space. Uh, this sketch that you see here is not definite. Um, the proposal right now is to put an AHO designation over the entirety of the property um, so that the location of the parkland and the um, affordable housing um, can be determined at a later date so that it's not handcuffed being either in the front or the rear of the property, that being the affordable housing. Um, that was a point of discussion that, that hasn't quite been set, uh, settled at this point. Um, so right, uh, the parcel contained a single family residence, which was condemned recently. Um, so it's otherwise unimproved. It's mostly uncleared. I will show you also that 
Recently, you've had um, two subdivisions that abut this parcel. The parcel is roughly in the center there. It's not highlighted. Uh, to the north was the EEB farm um, subdivision, four lot residential subdivision with a reserved area with a man-made pond, uh, which would abut the northern end of this parcel. And then an agricultural reserved area strip along the train track that you can see in the lighter green there. Um, to the east is the Panago Hill subdivision, another four lot subdivision. And you can see in dark green there, the two reserved areas that were established um, as part of that subdivision. So basically um, when the town is considering um, whether or not a partial should ha uh, have an affordable housing overlay designation, you're supposed to consider a number of factors, public water availability, um, close to downtown or, or shopping areas, uh, public transportation. This property meets the criteria for all of those. Um, there is an area of, um, uh, of businesses both abutting the parcel um, and then right across Panago Road. It's serviced by public water and it's along the um, public uh, bus line for Suffolk County Transit. Uh, I also attached to you a letter from the Community Housing Opportunity Fund Committee, um, which strongly urges the affordable housing designation on this property. Uh, I think everybody knows that there's a dire need for additional affordable housing in the town of East Hampton. Uh, and this could contribute to that. The theoretical maximum yield on this property is 56 attached apartment units or 15 single family residences. Um, uh, assigning the AHO designation would in theory allow for that as a maximum. Um, there might be different methods to get there, whether it be wastewater treatment or transfer of development rights, um, but that would be the theoretical maximum. This doesn't behold this property to that level of development and that's, and. Currently, there is no project um, in a draft stage for an affordable housing development. So those numbers are not set in stone um, if that designation is given. Um, so basically, um, we recommended, we being the planning department to the town board, um, that in keeping with their intention of when they purchased this property, that this, uh, we strongly recommend that this be given the AHO designation. Um, we hope that the planning board will echo that, um, but basically that is the uh, general concept here, and I'm certainly available for any questions that the board has. Very well. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we don't have somebody on the board who, wish, who reports, so if anybody wants to make a comment, I'd ask you to please you know, keep it brief. Um, this is affordable housing overlay, so, uh, and it's vacant land. So uh, I know how I feel about it, um, but uh, does anybody else uh, have anything, does anyone have anything they want to say about it? No, I think this is a, a good spot for something like this. Okay. And I would just say that the, the uh, community housing uh, committee, which I am a member of, um, also recommended to the town board that they do single family uh, housing here at a density not to exceed three units per acre. But <clears throat> I, I, I definitely uh, fully support this. Uh, at the risk of, thank you, Randy, at the risk of uh, being presumptuous, is there anyone who doesn't support the AHO designation on this? No, I think it's a good idea. I think I'd like to move that we, um, you know, send comments, favorable comments to the board. Yeah, I, 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 Thomas, we don't need a motion on that, do we, or Eric, do we need a motion on that, or just a, a yeah, I don't think so, it's not a formal resolution. Yeah, I don't no. think, yeah, neither did I. Right, uh, uh, Mr. Kramer, comment from the public? Uh, on this one? Go right yeah, ahead. Yeah, very uh, quick. I mean, I'm uh, not, I, I want to really speak on the next one, but very quick comment. First of all, I completely support the idea of affordable housing overlay on this property. I think it's very suitable. The only comment I want to make, and it's not really pertinent to what you're going to send, but the conceptual plan of putting the development at the back of the lot and the open space at the front does not make any sense to me. So when it comes around to actually developing it, I think the housing should be towards the front and the open space should be to the north. Yeah, yeah I agree I, with that. Yeah. I would suggest that, you know, that really what I wanted was from public comments to be from folks who are directly impacted by it. Um, so, but, you know, having said that, I, I would think you might be better off directing that comment to the town board rather than to us. Because I think the, the, the planning 
at the extent of our comment is the uh, uh, placement of the AHO on this particular parcel. So, um, I Pam, I would, I would, I think it would be uh, uh, helpful if we, if we just did a, you know, a, a roll call vote or something. Not, not a roll call, but I think if, well, if we could I, say I, that. It's unanimous. I think that would be. Uh, I, I, so I thought I did that. I said, "Is there anybody who disagrees with, with that?" And I didn't think. I thought I didn't hear anyone say anything. You know, it was one of those. Well, uh, Ian isn't he, here, uh, so Ian's not here, and that'll yeah. be included in our comments that there was there was right. of the board present. So uh, you know, uh, one of those, Randy. It's one of those speak now, forever hold your peace deals, and I don't think anyone spoke now. So that's our piece. Sorry, sorry for the mangling of the language. Is that, is that all right with everyone? Yeah. Yes, let's move on. All right, now on to Wayne Scott. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, just, uh, I think it was Mr. Whalen's client was uh, here previously. Yes, I, she may still be on. I don't know if she is. Okay, but you'll be speaking, will you be speaking for her? I am, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Eric, take take it away. Okay, um, I'm just preparing the visuals here. Um, but basically, this is a proposal to change from CB central business to B residence with a limited business overlay. Um, a total of seven properties at the western end of the down of the well downtown Wayne Scott, the the Wayne Scott business corridor on Montauk Highway. Um, I will show you the parcels now. Um, with a wide overhead view. Um, and then also, excuse me, I'd like to put the zoning designation boundary here. Um, so as you can see here, uh, and I should zoom in a little, okay, now you have the uh, zoning labels. So this is basically the core um, downtown area of, of um, Wayne Scott. And the proposal would be to uh, add the LBO to the highlighted properties here. Now, this is a proposal that comes directly from the Hamlet study of, uh, of Wayne Scott, um, which was to rezone these properties in the manner that's being currently proposed. And this, um, I attached this to um, this page of the Hamlet study report to um, what I submitted to the planning board. But basically, um, the recommendation, uh, you can read it right here. It's, it's specific to this area. Uh, and it's, uh, it well, talks about the, um, that it's a, the central business area is a linear strip, consolidating the traditional downtown business uses into a pedestrian oriented core area with coordinated highway access and parking is a key objective of the Wayne Scott plan. Restricting the uh, linear extent of the CB zone will help reinforce the desirable walkable pattern of development. The land in the westernmost section of the CB zone is bordered by protected open space and residential development and is generally characterized by low intensity, uh, low traffic generating uses. The area functions, functions as a transition zone between the entrance to East Hampton and the core business area. Intensification of development and traffic generating uses in this area will reduce functionality of Montauk Highway. Rezoning this area to residents with an LBO will continue to permit low intensity business uses with second story apartments and focus the more intense uses to the east where they can be better accommodated. So that's a, the specific recommendation um, of the Hamlet study. And um, I suppose skipping back to the aerial and zooming in a little bit, um, the memo that uh, was given to the town board uh, from the planning department was actually um, prepared by Joanne Powell, who retired uh, last week. Um, but this is one of the last memos that she prepared um, for the town board. Uh, in the memorandum, um, she goes through really two major um, uh, aspects of you know what this rezoning would be affected. It would have um, that being really the uses that would be allowable and the dimensional regulations that would apply. Um, to either redevelopment or, you know, um, well, complete redevelopment of the site or additions to the existing structure. So, um, <laughs> as you know, CB is one of the most, um, allows the, one of the most largest variety of uses other than CI uh, in the town. Uh, in the LBO uh, district, uh, you could have the following uses, animal husbandry, which is unlikely, Antique shop, artisan craftsman's workshop, 
office, uh, personal service shops, such as barbershops, beauty parlors, um, a riding academy, which actually none of these lots are large enough to, to accommodate, a taxi company, a florist or flower shop, a tennis club, also they're not large enough really, uh, and semi-public facility, which comes in various forms. Um, so she notes that um, of the six parcels, and there really are seven here, but one of them is the park that was re uh, recently purchased um, by the town. So there's really six remaining privately owned parcels. Uh, four of these contain office uses, uh, which are permitted under CV zoning and would be specially permitted under LBO. Uh, one has a single family residence, which will, um, is pre-existing non-conforming under CB, but would become permitted under the LBO because the underlying zoning would be residential. Uh, the sixth, uh, containing the Eastgate Cottages, um, has a CO for multiple residents, which is a pre-existing non-conforming use under both the current CB and the LBO um, designations. So um, she lists in here the, the individual parcels. Um, this one, uh, I think we're starting- um, Start on the west. Yeah, uh, starting on the west. On the east, on the east. On the east, uh, on the east yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, this is uh, a two-story professional office and storage building. This is a single family residence. This is the, multi hopefully you can see my cursor here. I'm skipping over the park right here. Uh, this is the multiple residence with 12 rental units. And then these are three individual um, lots with, with offices. Um, so, Basically, um, one thing to keep in mind with the LBO designation is it only applies to the commercial aspect of it only applies to the first 200 feet in depth. Um, all of these properties are right up to 200 feet in depth. So essentially, the entirety of the uh, parcels would be able to be redeveloped uh, commercially. Um, trying to hit the pertinent points here. Um, again, there's also a... a a um, limitation to the size of a building you can have. Um, so uh, the, that limitation is 2,000 square feet in the LBO. Um, the Wayne Scott Professional Center is uh, totals 3,265 3, square feet, so it would not be allowed to, um, to expand. Uh, that's the, the office buildings um, in the corner here. Uh, the two lots with existing residential structures, one of them has a very small residence of uh, 832 square feet, I believe, um, from what I heard at the um, Town Board public hearing that Mr. Whalen, um, who's here, uh, represents the owner of that lot, but he can speak to that, um, uh, should you allow him to. Uh, the other one is uh, 1,900 square feet, so um, obviously the smaller um, residence has... Um, could over double in size, but the, the other larger residents would only be allowed a, a modest um, addition with that 2,000 square foot cap. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, so it's also noted here, um, no new single and separate vacant lot can be created unless the planning board, board requires a recordable instrument limiting the use of the newly created lot to a single family residence or for a park or open space purposes. I think I'm skipping to something irrelevant there, but um, the point of interest is that three of the subject lots have large lot easements and cannot be further subdivided. Um, factoring in parking requirements, two of the other parcels could not practically be developed if subdivided under current zoning uh, and would not have sufficient lot area. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of, I should have skipped this. She, she's talking about the subdivision um, potential of, of the yeah. lots, which is it's... virtually nil. Um, uh, so, and then also the LBO does have codified architectural standards. Um, those uh, should be considered as well. Um, that is a, you know, uh, another difference. She's highlighting the differences here between what would be allowed in redevelopment under the current CB zoning versus the LBO, which again, going back to the Hamlet study, that recommendation is in part to soften um, this transition zone into the uh, downtown Wayne Scott area. Um, so I guess the other, besides use, um, the other main thing are the setback and dimensional requirements. Um, I won't go into this, um, into the, you know, kind of minutia of the exact details. She does detail the changes for, for each exact lot, but, um, you know, as you would suspect the, um, CB zoning, 
um, setback requirements and building and total lot coverage uh, requirements, the maximums are, um, well, minimum setbacks, maximum coverage are am amongst the most, um, you know, the least stringent of uh, any, any of the zoning designations we have in the town. That obviously would change with a B resident zoning designation and an LBO. Um, it would require greater front yard setbacks, you know, greater setbacks for Montauk Highway in this case, uh, and greater uh, side and rear yard setbacks. Um, additionally, the, the allowable building and lot coverage would um, decrease under under that zoning result, uh, designation, uh, that being the LBO, if uh, the town board does elect to make that change. Um, so basically, um, the conclusion here is the town adopted the Wayne Scott Hammer plan uh, into the town's comprehensive plan. This plan recommends that the westerly most section of the area zone CB be rezone, rezoned to be resident in LBO in order to prevent highway sprawl, reduce traffic, and create a transition between a residential area and a more developed commercial area. Um, so the, it was directed to the town board to discuss the implications of that rezoning on the six privately owned parcels. And um, just as with the previous discussion, uh, it is part of the town code that the planning board is to give their recommendation on any rezoning um, request or proposal that's made, their recommendation that being to the town board, um, so I will leave you to discuss this. And again, obviously, any questions you have, um, I'm right here. Very well. Thank you, Eric. Um, first of all, before, uh, and I know Mr. Whalen wants to speak, L LTV, do we have anybody on the line who uh, wants to speak on this? Um, Chair, there are two callers on hold. The first caller is the person that you referenced who called in at the very beginning. She's been on hold the whole time. All and right. there is a second caller. I don't know. If it pertains to this, but I would imagine so. If you'd like, I can open it up to them first if you want to check. Yeah, let's do that. Let's see who they are and uh, give them a chance to hang up if they want to or wait. And, sure. Uh, speak. I'll unmute that number. The last four digits end in 1997. I'll unmute that now. Hello, caller. There's a little delay, I believe. Caller, if you can hear me, the phone ending in 1997. You're live with the planning board. Hello. Sir? They might, that's just a replay of our previous um, recording because there's an echo. They have the feed on in the background. I'll do one last time. Uh, phone ending in 1997. Are you there? Hello, caller. Are you there? Okay, Chair, I'm going to mute them because they're not responding, you. and you can move on to whomever you'd like. Uh, Mr. Whalen, do you want your client to speak or you to speak? And again, I'm going to ask you to keep it, you know, brief because, you know. Oh, yeah, let me, I, I, you know, I'm sure Nina will want to speak separately, but I would like to, uh, to, yeah. to make a pitch for her first. So first of all, Richard Whalen, I'm representing Nina Bataller. Nina is the owner of the easterly two lots that are affected by the proposed rezoning. Those are... 372 Montauk Highway and 374 Montauk Highway, uh, the far eastern ones. There we go. Uh, they're both around 10,000 square feet. The easterly building is actually occupied by a, uh, a design, a residential home design studio. It both does, as I understand it, I got this information from my client and from talking with Pat Trenzo, they uh, do design work for uh, homeowners and they also sell furniture and other furnishings directly to those people and they have a showroom for that purpose. So it's sort of a cross retail uh, office design type of use. That lot, I just want to point out, that lot is already overdeveloped under central business zoning. So there's nothing further you can do on the property right now. Uh, next door, however, is Nina's house. That is 374. 374 Montauk Highway, and uh, Eric had the cursor there a moment ago. Uh, I think the house is something like uh, 768 square feet. It's a very small one-story house. It's on a one uh, 10,000 square foot lot. Uh, Nina uses that as her residence. She has a frame shop as a home occupation. Okay, the frame shop, East Hampton frame shop, is home occupation use. There we go. The red building is on the right. That's a... Uh, that is uh, a barn type building as I just described what it chooses. Notice the big building behind it. Notice the studio, there's an art studio in the lot behind it. 
That's proposed to stay in the central business zone, all right, right behind. That's not owned by Nina Vitaler, the, uh, that, that white uh, gabled um, building right there. And Nina's is the little yellow building to the left. So let me start by saying this, all right. Um, I think by and large, the, the Hamlet studies that the town did were, were done very well. I think the people who worked on them did a generally good job. But when it comes to this recommendation, I can only reach one conclusion, and that is that they thought they needed to do something or recommend something, and they said, well, let's recommend we change these properties here to be residents LBO because it'll reduce whatever. It's not going to accomplish that, all right? There are six affected lots. If you take out the former swamp building, the swamp property, which is now a, a town pocket park, there are six lots. All of them except for Nina's house are commercially developed. Uh, the Wainscot Professional Center, which Pat Tronzo owns at the Western End, those three lots, they're fully developed. They're an, it's an office complex. Uh, just east of him is a multiple dwelling motel type use, which you can see uh, where the cursor is. By rezoning that to be residence, which is, let's let's make this clear first of all, LBO, the underlying zoning is B residence. It's got an LBO overlay, which the town board has changed from time to time, what that means. But the underlying zoning is residential. You zone that thing from central business to be residential with an LBO, you're pretty much locking in the non-conforming use. There's, they're not going to convert the property to one family house. So they're stuck with what they've got. Uh, I, I think um, when you look back the history of the LBO district, the first LBO was something called the Retail Business Limited Business Overlay, and that was created in 1971. The modern zoning code in 1984 modified that into what we now know as, again, the LBO. But it is fundamentally a residential zone. All the dimensional requirements, the dimensional setbacks, the coverage requirements, they are all B residents, all right? Right now, I, I did my homework before I spoke with the town board last week. On the Montauk Highway, the north side of the Montauk Highway in Wainscot, from Town Line Road to Wainscot Stone Road, right? That's the eastern end of the Wainscot Business District. Remember, Wainscot Stone Road does cross over the highway there. There is one residence, one residence on the Montauk Highway. That is Nina's little house, all right? The effect on her commercial property, if you rezone it, is not that great because it's just going to continue as it is. But the effect on her house property is, is pretty dramatic. Um, she's stuck with the residence. There are a few allowable commercial uses in the LBO, but you're limited in terms of what you can do by the coverage and the setbacks. Most importantly, coverage. Total coverage falls from 80% in central business to only 50% in the B resident zone. Let me cut to the chase. What I said to the town board and what I'd like to say to you, uh, and I, I, I think I'm the town board, you know, we had, there was a hearing on this last Thursday. They all uh, seem to be paying careful attention and I, I'm, I'm hoping we had a receptive audience. There is an alternative, all right? I understand that the, the Wayne, the, uh, the Wayne Skid Hamlet study wants, at least to, for appearance purposes, wants to make it look as though the town is, uh, you know, downscaling the potential for future development notwithstanding, again, that five of the six lots are basically fully commercially developed, what I would ask you to consider, and I can ask you to consider recommending this to the town board, go to neighborhood business zone. A neighborhood business zone is less intense. There's less total coverage. There are fewer allowed uses than there are in the CB. It's basically an intermediate step between the central business zone, which is the current zoning, and B residents LBO, which is extremely restrictive. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that's what the town board will consider. And I would like to, to recommend that you recommend to the town board that it consider some sort of a lesser included option. And I would offer for that um, uh, neighborhood business only. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Mr. Um, I understand from um, uh, th that there's somebody, there's another caller on uh, LTV. Excuse me, Chair. Just the, previ I, the previous person that I tried to unmute has left. They're no longer okay. there. And the, previ the previous woman, I believe, Nina, we've been talking about is still on hold. That's it. All right, very well. Um, Nina, if uh, you indicated you might want to speak, if you uh, feel like you have anything to add, I'm going to ask you to just keep it brief. Uh, Chair, I'll unmute her. I haven't unmuted that please. now. Yes, I'll please do. Sorry. Yes, please do. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for um, letting me speak. I really appreciate it. Um, 
I've been sitting in my car on the side of the road, so I had cell phone service. Um, obviously, you guys know about that. I own the two properties. One change I would say is whoever said that the building on the right, the eastern side of the building, it's not an office building. It's a retail store, and it's been a retail store since it was built in 1964, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I've owned the property since 2004 and have had retail stores there ever since. Uh, my recent tenant is, um, she does do interior design, but she uses it as a showroom for a store. She sells furniture, she sells all kinds of stuff, pottery and rugs and, you know, it's all really high end and it's very expensive and very fancy, so she does a lot of it by appointment, but it's definitely a store, it's not an office by any means. Um, um, I'm just looking at my notes, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I do want to say that I, I, I object to the extremely restrictive zoning classification um, of the residential with limited business overlay. And, um, you know, 374 Montauk Highway is my primary residence. It's, it's on less than 100 by 100 square foot lot. It's, it's a tiny little piece of property. And out of the six that we're talking about, it's, it's the only residence. And all the other ones are already built out. They're all commercial structures, so mine's really the only one that's going to be the most impacted by all this. You know, I, I, I understand that the zoning is going to limit those as well, but my house is the one that's the most impacted. Um, and I'm talking about the changes that LBL means in terms of the lot coverage. Rick spoke about that a little bit. Um, but when you're talking about a tiny piece of land, I just want to make sure you guys understand the, 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 the amount of space you're talking about. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to go from 80% of the lot to 50% of the lot. So specifically in my case, we're talking about 7,700 square feet total, including the parking and the whatever accessory, whatever you guys call it. It goes down to 4,800 square feet. It's really small. Um, I'll have 40, when you do the math, it's actually 40% less overall lot coverage to make that change. It's huge. It's like a really big deal when you're talking about a small space. You know, if you're talking about a big piece of property, it's a totally different thing. Um, my lot is 9,643 square feet. So we're talking about 7,714 square feet is the exact, it's currently allowed, going down to 4,821 proposed. Um, historically, my residence property has always been, since 1954, surrounded on all, four, uh, on all sides by commercial properties. Um, you know that the town bought the place next door, and it's going to continue to be zoned commercial. It borders my property on the west side, all the way across the back of both of my properties. And then to uh, the newly property, what did I write? I'm sorry, I made notes. Um, Behind it, there's also the new building that's just been put up. It was actually put up before the Wayne Scott people even did that survey. It was put up after the Wayne Scott survey was done. Um, on the eastern side of my property is SRK Pool Company. Um, they, uh, we have a fence that goes between us. They continue to maintain their CB commercial zoning. They keep an entire fleet of trucks and heavy-duty commercial construction equipment on the property, like right next to mine. So it's just to be clear, it's not like I'm living in like a normal residential neighborhood at all. I'm surrounded by commercial property on three sides, and I'm facing the busiest road in the Hamptons, and that's not going to change in any way. Like, when you guys say you want to soften the transition, well, let's see. You know, there's office buildings, then there's a park, then there's a little teeny little property, and then there's construction company, and then there's really hard, res you know, commercial, and there's home goods right next to him. Okay. So, Nina, uh, we... we, we, we... We get it. I mean, we we heard from Rick, and I appreciate you feel passionately and strongly about this. But we really need to go on to our own discussion. So, and we can see from the overhead. So, uh, I don't mean to well, be abrupt, but I, you know. I, I, and I don't mean to interrupt you, sir. But you know, this is like really important to me. This is like a little bit of you know, like just, I have to put a note on your on your agenda. And I just waited here for an hour and forty five minutes on a cell phone on the yeah. side of the road so I could talk to you. I know I appreciate you know, it. I just I, I I have to be cognizant of the time, and and you know it, it, we have a lot of we had a lot of items on the agenda that took a lot of time. So uh, Sam, Sam, can I, I, can I, I have one point I did. Rick, Rick, we haven't. You know, Sam, Sam, this is thirty seconds. Sorry. Thirty seconds, please. Thirty. Seconds. One other thing I forgot to mention here, talking about the dimensional rules, you'll find in the planning department memo 
Um, among other things, when the town board changed the zoning, the LBO regulations in 2005, they specify, first of all, if you have an existing residence on the property, and Nita's house was built in 1954, you're required to use the existing house. You are not allowed to even move the house. So if someone wanted to redevelop her lot, her residential lot, let's say for an office, you couldn't even put the parking behind the building, nor could you build a new purpose-built building for office, because that's how the LBO regulations are right now. So it's very strict, and I think an alternative, as I, again, propose to the town board, uh, and I would ask you to do, would be to recommend NB zoning instead of B residence and LBO. All right, thank you. All right, um, I want to turn it over to the board. Um, I, I, I know how I feel, but uh, uh, let me hear from, uh, let me start with Ed, and I'll just go around the table, if you don't mind. So, Ed, could you chime in? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I, I definitely hear the arguments being made by Nina and by and and by Rick, and um, I totally, I, you know, I really do understand the objective here and why the Hamlet study, you know, made this recommendation. Um, I really like to hear from other members of the board and how they feel about this. But if there is sort of if there's another way to accomplish the same thing without creating the kind of hardship we're talking about, I think we need to consider it. Uh, you, know, <clears throat> it you know, there are many sort of high concept ideas in the Hamlet study. And I think when you get down to the brass tacks of, of executing and implementing something, I think we, we begin to sort of see some of the detail in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm open to the idea of, of considering something else. Right, thank you very much, Ed. Sorry to put you on the spot like that, but- That's okay. I knew, I knew that this week I'd start with you, so. <laughs> um, um, Ian's not here. Uh, oh, well, Lou, you're, you're next in, the, in, this, in line anyway, so go right ahead. You're muted. You're still muted, Lou. Sorry about that. Can't, couldn't find the mute, unmute button. Um, anyway. I'm, uh, I'll just make it brief. I'm, um, I'm convinced by Rick's argument uh, that uh, I think this, this does, uh, uh, I, I think it does present a hardship to uh, his client. And I think that, it, uh, I believe that his suggestion is a good one. And I think that suggestion will uh, also accommodate what the board, the town board is trying to do to make that a transition uh, area in Wainscott. So uh, I would recommend to the town board that they re reconsider their original uh, decision and uh, take up uh, Rick's suggestion. I think that would accomplish, uh, that would kill two birds with one stone. So that's Thank my-, my Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Kathy? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I think that, uh... I want to applaud the town board for taking steps to implement the Hamlet plan, the Hamlet studies and the comprehensive plan. Uh, Wayne Scott is a Hamlet that's needed attention for a long time and I'm glad that they're picking this up, but I feel as though, um, you know, I think, I think Ed said it best that if, a, if a, uh, the solution can be sought in a less restrictive way, especially given these six particular lots, uh, that would not be so um, punitive to the one the only residents in there, and the idea is here to support residences, it would seem to me, then I think um, we might try a, a different approach, recommend a different approach. And if it doesn't work, you can always go back to the residents, but you know, you can upgrade to this next level again. But it seems to me as though neighborhood business would really um, solve the problem. Yeah, okay, Randy, thank you, Kathy. Randy? Uh... Yeah, I, I agree. I think I would go a little further with a, a scalpel and say um, NB up to the old swamp, and that should be rezoned parks and conservation. There's no point in leaving that in. A, yeah, that's a good know? idea. Yeah. Right, Thank right. You, Randy. And, and then, then the, the, uh, the Wayne Scott, the medical 
complex, I would say, and B. And then those two, if I'm not mistaken, there are two houses on the westernmost section. Is that right? No. It's, um, it's, it's all uh, the Wayne Scott. Um, oh, it is. Profession. Okay. Yeah, that's where it ends. That's where okay. that's where this this rezoning ends. So there's two houses between the swamp and the Trunzo. Mm -hmm. Or no, no that's the motel. hotel. There's, okay. a motel, there's a motel kind of thing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I I'm, I I I I find their arguments persuasive too. And NB with a little PC in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, I listened to the town board meeting this this afternoon, and um, I was. I think they make a very good argument. I think neighborhood business would 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 do the trick, and um, especially since she's the only one there with a residence. Thanks, Sharon. I, I hope that the applicant now isn't too upset with me for <laughs> for for cutting the discussion a little short because that was exactly the way I see uh, uh, the the the, uh, we, the the town does want to do something they do want to um, soften the impact I think that the, the, there's very little danger of anything happening uh, to the professional center I mean they spent seven years or some some incredibly long period of time before the planning board getting that thing just exactly perfect and let me tell you I drive past it nearly every day and it's just exactly perfect uh, so I, I I think it's it's fine I don't expect that there would be any change to that anytime soon I think mean, Randy uh, uh, raised the, the the right point about what is known as, uh, I hope I get the name right, folks, Del Mastro Park uh, over there in Wayne Scott, uh, which was recently uh, put into place, and it's a very lovely space. And, uh, you know, it, 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 and I think putting it in PC will is a really good idea. And, you know, if, and, but the real salient issue here is the impact on these two tiny lots on 27. And I think that uh, the applicant, uh, uh, and the applicants count, not the applicants, sorry, it's not applicant. uh, uh, that uh, the uh, property owner and the property owner's council have come up with a very good idea, uh, a compromise, if you will. So I think that it's, you know, Ed, did you want to chime in? Because I know you kind of held back there for a second. Uh, are, you, are you on board with all of this? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think it makes tremendous sense. I'm glad we came back to you then. So it's, uh, I, 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 these are the recommendations. Six, again, one member had to leave early, but uh, all six of us are unanimous in our belief in this. So again, thank you. Thank you uh, sorry you for, uh, you know, cutting you off there, but uh, it is 8.57 now, and we have one item on the regular meeting, which is Lou. Hi, Rick. Hi. Bye. Well, take care, Rick. Uh, Lou, the Montauk Marine Base and Communications Antennas. I'm not going to read the rest of this. <laughs> you go ahead. <laughs> In the matter of the application of Montauk Marine Base and Communications Antennas, Verizon Site Plan Special Permit Personal Wireless Service Facility Modification <laughs> to South Suffolk County Tax Map Number 300-6-3-17 comma 20.1 comma 20.2 comma 21. I have read the resolution amending approval and I move for its adoption. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Opposed? No. Hey, that wasn't an, op an opposed, was it? It was not. Aye. Thank you. Okay, six nothing. All right, before we take a resolution to uh, adjourn, um, we have no meeting next week. Our next meeting after that is on July 7th. I will not be there, um, but uh, you will be in Kathy's more than capable hands. And there's a possibility that we will be moving out of this cyber world. I don't know, I haven't heard anything definite, but I, I do, I have heard that the town board is doing some kind of hybrid or something, and they're the night before us. So it's possible that this may be our last or almost last mm -hmm. uh, Zoom meeting. With that, I want to once again thank LTV because, you know, uh, when the history of the pandemic is written, LTV is going to be on page one.
So that's uh, true. <laughs> but this town, no, we were, you know, and, and, and all kidding aside, we, you know, a year, a year and some months ago, we all the people who, you know, do these meetings were all like, how are we going to operate? And the answer is LTV stepped up. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't, and there were remarkably few glitches when we got, you know, the plane flying. So uh, thank you. And our wonderful planning department. And, and yes, and the planning department and the planning board staff. Jody, right. thank, you. thank you all. Um, like I say, I won't be here on July 7th, but we will be back on July uh, the, the, the 21st. And uh, so I will look forward to seeing you then. And uh, did anyone have anything they wanted to add before I take a motion to adjourn? Uh, just a quick note, I'm not gonna be uh, here on the seventh either, just ah. for the record, okay? Thank you, Ed. So sorry, sorry. so when are, when are we gonna know about whether it's hybrid, not hybrid or whatever for the, we don't know. <laughs> okay. That's why That's why they make email. All right, fine, <laughs> got it. And special, <laughs> a special shout out to Mike at LTV. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, here, thank here. You for keeping us on. Hey, Mike. Thank you. Thank with, you. with that, I will wish you in advance a happy Independence Day, and uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor. <laughs> All those in favor. Aye. 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 We are adjourned at 9. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.